Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Stuart Hazeldean. Uh, I'm at the University of Edinburgh. I'm officially a professor of carbon capture and storage, but in this great spirit of diversity and uh, academic interchange, we can also do hydrogen. Uh, so thank you very much all for coming. So we've got about, we have about 80 and 90 people booked into the room. I'm not expecting everybody to turn up. We're about, sorry? Difficult to hear. Can you turn the volume up? Right. Um, we've also got uh, several tens of people online. So when we're doing uh, after each lecture, there's hopefully going to be a bit of time for questions. So I'll alternate between people in the room and people online. Uh, so that's clear. The menu or the schedule for the day is pretty much as advertised, uh, depending on which version you've got, I think, uh, then uh, at 1420 and 1440, one of them is Ika Thaisen dialing in and the other one's Nicholas Heinemann live in the room. So that just may have switched between your switch slots on the talk schedule. But apart from that, I think it's all as written. Uh, so I'm going to start off by saying hello and welcome. So I've said hello and welcome. Uh, fire alarms, usual sort of British stuff. If there's a fire alarm, then it's going to be a real fire alarm. And then we head out the door and, and go into the quadrangle outside. So don't go wandering around the building. Uh, toilets are out the door, turn right. And if you're short of any caffeine during the course of the day, uh, you can go out the door, turn left, and there is a cafe embedded in the building. So you can uh, you can buy yourself drink or food anytime you want, but we will be providing coffee uh, and tea in the breaks as scheduled uh, on, the, uh, on the talk uh, menu. So that all seems clear. So uh, in this, uh, this is really to celebrate and communicate some of the results of what is called the High Store for uh, project, which is an academic research project funded by the Research Council, Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council, uh, which we started off about three and a half years ago. And uh, uh, now this is the official finish uh, after several delays and extensions, uh, though the project itself will continue for another till about end of August or September, I think we're finishing off. But this we chose as a as a good date when we could try and get a lot of people together, both from university research and from industry and business and from government, because again, we're trying to join between and co-develop between all these different uh, interest groups in the country, uh, because shifting to hydrogen as part of the energy transition is a pretty major item. and. Uh, it's going to need some pretty major solutions. And so the focus of the High Store Poor project was about storage of hydrogen in porous rock. And when we first started that, everybody said, what do you want to do that for? Uh, but within about a year, everybody said, can we join? Uh, so the sentiment has changed very rapidly and uh, moved on. So I'll just give a few slides now, hopefully, to introduce where we where we are, eight to nine minutes worth of slides started off, I think, from my records first meeting in late 2020. I'm not going to be held to the date, but uh, we started off as a project which was something like a couple of years and with extensions and this and that and the other. Then uh, uh, we ended up here. We are about three years later and our original graphic of underground storage was this and we'll compare that with where we've ended up at the end of the project. It's slightly more complicated, which is good. But right from the start, we recognise the application of hydrogen into these different types of sector in the energy system in the UK, whether it's uh, generating low carbon electricity, heat, storing energy, producing zero carbon products from fuel switching or from clean transport. So most of those applications which we'd identified in uh, way back three years ago are still current and still being looked at. So the question is, how much of an application will hydrogen have? But this has been an unusual project. It's been one of the most uh, interestingly difficult administrative that I've ever been involved in. So I have to say, having started it off between Nicholas Heinemann, Mark Wilkinson and myself a bit, then Katrina Edelman has driven most of the project most of the time. So any credit for the results should really be largely with Katrina. And one of the major problems was a lot of this project was lab work. So here's a picture of the pro of the problem we had, that during the course of this project, it more or less exactly coincided with the start of virus, which turned out into being empty classrooms for people like me, 
uh, lots of debate about where the virus did or didn't come from, and especially lots and lots of people passing on early. So really difficult logistical uh, time to actually try and run anything in a laboratory. So we had to adapt and change a lot of the project work we uh, tried to undertake, got extensions for that. So it has all now been pretty much successfully completed. Project partners uh, started off and continued, a small number of project partners, but a large number of industry and business partners. And again, that showed at an early stage the interest and commercial interest in trying to understand a bit more about hydrogen. And again, that's evident today. Again, we've got a mix of participants in the room from lots of different uh, or types of organisations. So our concept at the beginning of this was quite a simple work plan divided into academic sort of stage uh, sectors, strands, looking at reactions, physical reactions, chemical, geochemical reactions of hydrogen with the rocks, looking how hydrogen could flow through rock, uh, porous rock, because remarkably there was very little on, to no detail on that at all. Looking at simulation of how to work that with a computer, taking the uh, types of approach that an oil and gas industry would have with the underground and simulating fluid flow through the rock. Crucially, looking at public perception and stakeholder perception. And again, that seems to be a, a sticky area at the moment. The test uh, rollouts of hydrogen villages maybe are not going quite as smoothly as uh, we might have hoped for. So more effort needed on that and then how to uh, communicate and how to disseminate that. And one of the main means of dissemination, two main means of dissemination is through meetings and conferences like this. And the other type of dissemination is, uh, which is scheduled here, this is our schedule for the day, you've got this. And the other type of uh, means is publications. And this project has been spectacularly successful in producing academic uh, publications, which are usually all free to download. Uh, academic publications in a whole uh, swathe of areas uh, on those different areas from industrial engagement, storage in sandstones and porous rocks, storage in uh, salt caverns, uh, interactions of hydrogen on a fundamental scale with rock. And so there are 34 projects which I'm not expecting you to uh, output, project outputs which I'm not expecting you to read. We will put these on the website, project website in the next couple of days because I haven't quite caught up. So. That's, again, just illustrative of the huge range of output and involving something like, I haven't counted, but I expect it to be something like 30 or 50 academics around, uh, not just in the University of Edinburgh or, or SCCS, of course, but across the whole of Europe and indeed a large part of the rest, some of the rest of the world as well. So it's had a really strong international reach. And going back to one of the fundamental premises of hydrogen, why, what's the use of hydrogen? Uh, because obviously there's still a great debate between the pro-electricity people and the pro-hydrogen people. One of the main uses for hydrogen, I still think, I still think is the storage opportunity. So here's a graph uh, recently produced by Ian Staffel showing you as a percentage of renewable supply along the bottom, the increasing need for storage as you go uh, as a percentage of the uh, generation system. And this is just compiled as a meta study of people's uh, analysis of how much storage is needed in, a, in an energy system. And my sole point is here, we're storing very little energy at the moment. Okay, maybe three gigawatts of uh, supply. And of course, we need not just to consider the total, uh, the amount of uh, the amount of power supply, but we need to consider the total duration of that, the total amount of energy. So three gigawatts will help us if one wind farm goes off, but rapidly as the percentage of renewables increases on the system, then by 2030, you may be going to need to store 20 gigawatts. And by 2040, you're going, maybe going to need to store 30 gigawatts of power, but you're going to need to store that for maybe one month or two months worth. So that translates into tens or even hundreds of terawatt hours. So the role of energy storage is going to be, I still think, is showing to be quite critical. And where we are towards the end of the project, this graphic drawn by, I think, by Nicholas Heinemann in one of his publications, the simple concept of hydrogen storage in a porous rock we started off with has now become significantly more knowledge-based, splitting up into cap rocks, hydrogen plume migration, retention, uh, injection into the porous reservoir, which cushion gas are you going to use and why, 
uh, interactions of Cushion gases and brine and how the geology and the structure of the underground influences what you do. So again, a successful type of outcome in providing uh, not necessarily more uh, illumination, but significantly more knowledge and, uh, and complex understanding that this is going to be a complex system, which is going to need genuine understanding of how to exploit and manage that in the underground. And so uh, a simple statement of where we're at at the moment, uh, which you can uh, argue about if you want, but the biology is important. Uh, we've recognized that. Ike Thaysen will talk about that. So we'll talk about uh, microbes. Uh, the geochemistry of, react of simple reactions seems to be at the moment relatively straightforward. We didn't detect any great uh, reactivity with most minerals in the rock. Uh, cap rock, we can think about cap rock in the same type of way that we think about cap rock for, as for oil or gas or methane retention. You can usually uh, con contain more hydrogen than methane. And we also identified really large potential storage capacity in depleted gas fields around the UK. So if we want to do large scale hydrogen storage, then we can. And if you want to store in perhaps better understood salt caverns around the UK, then that's also possible that the question arises of, is there going to be enough salt underneath the land or are you going to have to go offshore and, and generate salt caverns offshore to handle the huge terawatt hour of uh, storage you're going to need? And uh, again, uh, storage opportunities offshore Scotland, offshore in the Irish Sea and all around uh, the parts of northern um, Germany and uh, and uh, Denmark and uh, Netherlands. So I think that's all I've got to say as an introduction. Uh, so again, welcome to this. And I'm going to pass over to Stuart Mackay uh, to give a little bit of a uh, commentary from the role of Scottish government about the importance of hydrogen. So Stuart Mackay, uh, I'd coincidentally, he and I had worked together quite a number of years on carbon capture and storage. Uh, Stuart Mackay handled that very adequately and set the ground for everybody else in the future and then left for verdant pastures of hydrogen where he's now successfully leading the Scottish group on that. So over to Stuart. Uh, do we do, I don't think I'll need any questions. So over to Stuart for 10 minutes. Okay. That was a great introduction. Didn't expect that, Stuart. Thanks very much. <laughs> All those years of talking about CCS in tiny rooms, then bigger rooms has been worth it. <laughs> I think. Can everyone hear me okay? Back. Hi. So my name's Stuart Mackay. Um, in Scotland, we always uh, check that there's two Stuarts in a room before we start. A conference, and that's that's a check for us, so we're fine. Hydrogen policy is quite exciting, actually, a space to be in. Um, but just to set the context for you about what I'm involved in, as opposed to what Stuart and all you guys are involved in, it's a wee bit different. So, if you think about the all the work that High Store Pod is doing to prove if we can store hydrogen in certain places. Me and my team, and I'm going to embarrass Susan and Helen, ask them to put their hands up. Susan and Helen are in my team. So, so we're working on how do you regulate such a thing? So we're assuming Stuart's going to, and, and all his team and Katrina and all that are going to solve all those problems for us. And they're going to say, yep, you can do that under these conditions. What we're concerned with is in parallel, getting regulation in place to do such a thing. So how do we regulate it? Who regulates it? What does that regulation look like? All that sort of stuff and all the different aspects of storage generally about hydrogen, because it's not all about geological storage. There's other ways to use hydrogen here. So just to give you a context, that's the kind of level that we are working at in the background at the same time as all this is going on. So I'll give you a wee introduction of what the Scottish Government thinks about hydrogen, um, what ministers have agreed to do, um, and what we're doing about that. So 
I'm sure you'll know that the Scottish Government is very keen on hydrogen. So we're very supportive. Our ministers are very supportive for two reasons. One is that we think we need it for net zero. To achieve net zero targets, we need hydrogen in certain parts of, this, of the energy sector. Not at the cost of electricity. Electricity is fantastic, it's very efficient. If you can electrify something, please do so. That's what our policy says. It's longer than that in more detail, but that's exactly what it says. But we recognise there are parts of our energy sector that are not conducive to electrification. I'll give you an example. And you guys know this better than me. High temperature heat is really hard to electrify. What you need to do is combust something, set something on fire, get some heat, get some steam. That's what you need for a lot of chemical processes as well, industrial processes. So industrial process heat is really hard to electrify. And we think that hydrogen is the answer to that. And perhaps other things like biomethane, but hydrogen principally. So that's one sector we're quite sure about. Heavy transport is another sector. So electric battery vehicles are great and they are getting better all the time. I wish I could afford one. Um, but when you start getting into heavier vehicles like 40 ton lorries, um, buses, um, trains, in some instances, ships, aviation, hydrogen and some sort of liquid fuel, some sort of sustainable aviation fuel, probably made from hydrogen, perhaps the CO2 added, is a really good contender for that sector to decarbonise it. So that's another role that hydrogen seems to be able to play. Controversial one is domestic heat. This is where the debate is about, and the, pardon the pun, the heat of the, the debate is about decarbonising. What I can say about that is that there's really good alternatives. Electric heat pumps are great, and they can be fitted pretty reasonably. They're, they're known technology. Um, if you've got a home that's quite new, they're great because insulation is fantastic in those new homes. So new build homes are great. There are some parts of the building sector that are not like that though, that are quite leaky and old and difficult to insulate. And perhaps hydrogen can play a role there in a, in a smaller network going forward. But the best thing about the gas grid is the gas grid itself. It's the transport system in our view for hydrogen. And you know what, it's already there. It already exists. And in, in the UK, we have, per population, the most extensive gas grid in the world, per population of head. So we have got this massive asset. It's fantastic. We want to repurpose that asset. We want to move hydrogen around the country, around Scotland and England, in that system. And we're doing an awful lot of work to prove that. Um, and also, you're probably aware that the distribution system which is the smaller pipelines. I think of the transmission system as the motorway and the distribution system as the, the B roads. So the B roads that takes gas to your home at the moment, most of them have been converted to polyethylene pipelines, those yellow ones. Um, they are suitable for hydrogen. So we've accidentally created the hydrogen network in the UK um, over the past sort of 10 or 12 years. It's not finished yet, it's not everywhere, but it's getting there. And it's funded already, so that will happen. Uh, repurposing it for hydrogen is the key, and we're doing a lot of work on that. Um, so we've set really big ambitions, five gigawatts. It depends how you calculate things, but that's about 700,000 tonnes of hydrogen. It could be up to a million. It depends on the blue content, the blue hydrogen content. It's quite a lot. A million tonnes of anything's a lot, isn't it? So that's quite a lot of hydrogen, five gigawatts by 2030. And obviously 25 gigawatts is huge. But it did appear huge when we set that ambition two years ago. Right now, the pipeline for hydrogen projects that are coming forward in Europe, oh my God, is 24 gigawatts. 
just to give you a scale. So this is why we think we're going to produce lots of hydrogen. Offshore wind is all around us. The Scott Wind process is underway. 28 gigawatts of projects have come forward. Maybe half of them will produce hydrogen. That's the way we're thinking. And it will export hydrogen abroad, possibly to Germany, probably to Germany. But we've got arrangements and agreements with the Port of Rotterdam, Hamburg and Wilhelm Haven at the moment, exploring that opportunity to build pipelines from Scotland to Germany to produce hydrogen and deliver it. This is the projects two years ago in our action plan that were on the map. There's now 94, there was 61 on this. It's just growing so fast. When we add them up, it's 6.4 gigawatts at the moment. Um, I'm not saying they're all, all going to be built, but what I'm showing you is the interest that's coming forward. And they're coming forward in regions and we're trying to create hydrogen hubs. We're, we're very keen on that to happen so that there's clusters of, of this uh, happening. Each cluster's got its own attributes. I'll share these slides later on, you can see them. You know, some of them have aviation, sustainable aviation fuel potential there, like Makrahanish Airport. But other ones have got port infrastructure that's really interesting for us. Poverty is amazing. That's where the big things happen in North Sea, uh, uh, offshore. The Fries and Galloway, Dundee, lots of innovation going on there. Fife H100 project, that's a 300 um, uh, boilers being installed this year um, and into next year. Very fantastic. It's going to be really interesting to see happen. Glasgow, our biggest city, lots of potential there. Grangemouth, lots going on there as well. Grangemouth is now is now as a fourth as a green uh, sorry green free port, as is Cromarty. Come back a page. And all these other places too. So you'll notice it's, it's everywhere, and especially the islands could be really big hydrogen potential generation areas, big economic potential there. Most of those projects will look something like this. There'll be electricity, renewable electricity, attached to an electrolyzer manufacturing plant, uh, sorry, an electrolyzer plant that produces hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen's interesting. Let's try and do something with that. And it will be either export it abroad or servicing indigenous demand, like just what I've mentioned, heavy transport, domestic heat, industrial heat. And uh, the eagle-eyed chemist will notice that NH3 is in this diagram on one of the containers. So ammonia is a really big, interesting thing in, in hydrogen at the moment. I think it will continue to be, actually. And this is what we've got in our economy already. This is what we have already. We are an energy nation. We export energy already. We're an oil and gas nation. Those skills can transfer to hydrogen quite readily. So we've got all this in supportive environment. So we're just trying to do something special with it. Our enterprise agencies are doing the same. So they're looking at manufacturing opportunities, supply chain, all that stuff. So we want to make money from this and the supply chain and transition people from the change that's coming. Because oil and gas is not going to last forever in terms of that sector. It needs to change, it needs to adapt, it needs to actually stop doing what it's doing in the future, and it needs to transition to something else, or those people will go somewhere else. We want them to stay here and do hydrogen stuff, and I think there's enough work. Our economists say that the hydrogen sector is going to be bigger, or potentially bigger, in terms of GVA than the oil and gas sector. Um, which is fascinating, isn't it, um, going forward? This is the box where the storage sits for us. All those things are going on. There's so, so much research going on that, that we are kind of corralling. And I, I, you know, I can talk to you later about that if you find me when I'm having a coffee. These are the reports that are quite significant that I would suggest you want to read if you have the time <laughs> and if you're interested. So it's a big policy area, lots of evidence based now, uh, lots of political uh, support going forward. And it's now seen as two things, uh, an economic opportunity, not just for the net zero stuff, but also um, energy security and resilience 
hydrogen is becoming a big feature of that in Europe, a big feature. And we can supply some of that, we think, from Scotland uh, and some of our own resilience going forward. So I'll leave it there. Um, I think that's my last slide. So these, happy to share these, Stuart, with everybody. You know, so, OK, thank you. There you go. Questions Happy to take questions if we'll like. just a few mic up, Grant. And, uh, has anybody got a quick question yet? Oh, so if you uh, we got a microphone. Oh, yeah, just shout. Um so obviously UK government developing the hydrogen transport and storage business model. I'm just wondering, as uh, the Scottish government, what your relationship with that model is. Are you developing something in conjunction or are you trying to fill a gap for with that business model? So I'll, I'll just address the whole thing. So I'll press the mic so that it's online. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, my eyes. The UK government are doing great things, actually, I think. So they're doing quite a lot of business models. It's not just that one. There's a storage model as well. Uh, there's other business models connected to hydrogen. Um, hydrogen to power is coming quite soon as well, that business model. So that's all about revenue. Um, and, you know, it's it's about sort of paying the producer to produce. As a devolved government, we don't have the powers to do that um, legally, but we support it. And we are feeding into the shape of it and how it looks and the content of it. And we're consulting. We're consulted on it. We have really close connections with our UK colleagues, our civil servants who work in hydrogen. The last count I had, there was 400 of them. So it's growing. Civil servants, we've got, you know, about a dozen. So we are very supportive of that. But we're also filling the gaps. So our, we've got £100 million of funding, which is a capital fund. So we're trying to fill the gaps in the at the start of projects and the capital purchase of equipment. The revenue side sorts, once the hydrogen is produced, it's like a CFD that you would be paid that for 15 years. That's great. But we are looking at the front part. OK, how do we help people get started to make those investment decisions? So that, that this is where we are targeting that. The Scottish government, sorry, the, the UK government also has a green hydrogen fund of its own, um, which is 240 million, I think it's. Um, and we are trying to weave in between those so that we can give support to Scottish projects that may already have that. So our criteria is not to exclude that. So if they get funding from the, the net zero hydrogen from the UK government, they can also get funding from us. You know, so we're, we're trying to marry that together and weave it between so that it doesn't compete, because that was never our idea. Uh, we're also supporting projects in different ways as well, just um, you know, from the capital fund, but also, I don't know if you're aware, we launched an innovation programme just last year. It's called the Hydrogen Innovation Scheme, which was £10 million. Pounds. So we're, we're supporting that early development as well. So we're weaving in between so that we don't cross over. But we, we, we like it. The hydrogen business model is a good idea. Okay. I'm going to ask you to continue else because we're already slightly more time. We'll do coffee anytime. Stuart's here all day, apparently, as, as the rest of the team is as well. So that's great. Thank you very much indeed. And in all that, then, we've alluded a lot of times to how hydrogen may or may not fit with the energy system. And so now we've got a couple of talks trying to uh, example that, provide some examples of that. Very pleased to welcome Grant Wilson, who's uh, exiled himself firstly to Sheffield and now to Birmingham, uh, but is an expert, been working on hydrogen in the energy system for many, many years. So Grant will talk to us about uh, hydrogen's role and particularly in storage, I think. Well, Thank you very much, Stuart. Can people hear me at the back? The mic is on. OK, great. Um, I'll maybe see if Do you need to point for them. I, I might do at times. Um, yeah, that will be visible to people at home as well. OK, um, you can go either clicking or that. Yeah. Brilliant. And I think if I press uh, this one is actually not. This is just connected to me, the monitor. What ah. do you need to see? I think if you press it bring, brings up like a laser instead of the pointer, but we'll leave it. Okay. It's fine. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'll just put on. Uh, I'll try and stick to the, the, the 20 minutes as best I can, because um, I'm fairly notorious for uh, 
perhaps overrunning a little bit. So um, I'll see if I, I, I can. So that's me. All these will be made available. Um, happy that everything is shared. So I'll just rattle through some of these. That's me. Uh, I lead the energy systems and data group at the University of Birmingham. Um, and I'm also a, a fortunate enough to be a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute as well. It's an honor, real honor actually, to present at this high store uh, final event, help set the scene on why I believe as a personal view, geological storage of hydrogen is a critical element, not will be, not it's up for debate. It absolutely is. We're not gonna hit net zero unless we have seasonal stores of energy and a significant and major part of that looks like a, a very, um, Significant contender is hydrogen, hydrogen storage itself. Um, there are clearly debates around how that hydrogen itself might be stored and where and what form, etc. But actually the need for that is something that we'll rattle through in this presentation. So we use visualizations. Um, I'm a massive fan of visualizations. I think we think um, we interpret data uh, better. We're kind of visual creatures as it were. So. Um, there's lots of charts in this presentation that I'll talk through and try and get us tuned into it. Um, and the visualiz visualizations will cover, it's basically, we're gonna look at the electrical system, how much storage is there already? What's the demand look like for the electrical system? And then we'll go into the gas system and then we'll go on to the liquid fuel system. So this is not looking at the future. This is basically saying, this is now, this is what's happened with the data that we've got from uh, various, um, sources effectively of, of what's happening at the moment. Three main points to consider as we go through this. Past performance is, is kind of no predictor for, for future um, in as much as we do have these uh, very large amounts of storage on the system at the moment, but it doesn't mean that perhaps we're going to need as much in the future. So this is just looking at sort of raw storage in big numbers, uh, particularly if storage itself is going to become more expensive, we would naturally think that we want to use less of it. So we have a more, personally, I don't like the phrase, but I'm going to use it here, a more optimized system overall, a more optimized whole energy system where we don't potentially need quite as much energy storage dotted about the place because it's more expensive and therefore we need to think about that. Uh, Great Britain energy trends are for an increase in end use electrical demand that takes market share away from gas and liquid fuel forms of energy, just corroborating what uh, Stuart was saying there. Um, but one of the things with that, as the electrical system itself becomes more and more important, there's more primary energy delivered for end use through the electrical system. It, uh, it's a need for a wider energy systems to support that. OK, so if more is going through the electrical system, more things are dependent on the electrical system. We do need to support electrical generation through that. It's not a single low wind event. It's actually it's a bunch back to back. OK, so you have wind, froth. Um, might happen over a week. You get wind coming back over two or three days. Then you get another wind trough for a week. That on a wind heavy generation and having a, a large amount of electrical energy shifted over into the maybe one and a half, two terawatt hours a day of electrical demand. One of the interesting things about wind is when you get a trough, it doesn't matter how much wind generation you have, you still get very little out of it. So it's not as if you get you know double of very little, it's still very little. Uh, so you can keep doubling up, doubling up in terms of your generation capacity but it's output when you don't have wind, you don't have wind. It's, it's really stark. Um, so most charts are available online through this version. Uh, here is a public tableau. It's in sort of uh, train, has been for a little while in terms of process, but it is there. People can muck about with that themselves. I encourage people to do so. So we'll start off with the GB, Great Britain Electrical System. Have a look how much non-fuel energy storage for the electrical system is in place at this point in time. So this is from Solar Media, I'm just grabbing that, in terms of this is battery storage that's gone in over a number of years. Um, so they think there's about 2.6 gigawatt hours of battery storage on the system. So 
by and large, you've got about 30 gigawatt of pump storage on the system at the moment. I know there's uh, interest in putting more onto the system in Scotland in particular, but it's it's not on the system yet. And just a, a real estimate of battery storage in electric vehicles and hybrids, broadly around the same amount as the pump storage um, amount at this point in time. But I would say that is highly uh, sort of uncertain. That's a, a, a real guesstimate at the moment this week. Um, so you know, taking a ballpark figure of it, other forms of electrical storage, an estimate of about 100 gigawatt hours of electrical storage online, if you add all of them up. But that is uh, presuming you can use all the electrical uh, energy in a, an EV battery, which clearly is not the case, not least because it's not V2G at the moment, they're not even uh, connected. Um, so we'll look at this chart just for a moment to get people's eye in. This is uh, data going all the way back to July, uh, 2011. If I'll, for people online. Yes, could you look at this? Yeah. Here? Uh, you'll have the PowerPoint. It might be that one. Yeah. So if that works, yeah, brilliant. Um, so what you're looking at there is the daily demand of electricity in Great Britain. Uh, over a 12 year period, is it 12 or 30 year period, whatever that happens to be. Um, you can see the seasonality there. It's higher in winter, as we would expect, and lower in the summer. So that cyclical element that you have there, higher in winter, lower in summer, happens every year. We can see, um, not so clear on this diagram, perhaps because it's a lot of data, but we can see a big drop over in the middle of the winter period, which is where industry uh, commerce, etc. People are on holiday, it's Christmas and New Year, so there's a big drop in um, electrical demand. Um, if you spread this out effectively, one of the things you can do at the bottom when it's, when it's online, um, just to you choose the slider at the bottom, shift it back and forth, and you can basically see whichever time frame you, you want to have a look at. There's lots of little dips along here. Um, and those are the weekend because we use less electricity on a Saturday and a Sunday than we do from Monday to Friday. And therefore, it's fairly regular from that perspective. But a couple of things uh, to point out with this big drop over uh, COVID in terms of it's easy to see there. Uh, the announcement 30th of March, I think it was two, 2020. And on Sunday night, Boris came on the television and said whatever he said. And then the next day, uh, there was a significant decrease in electrical demand. Um, so um, a couple of things with this uh, is there is a trend, uh, sorry, the green line is low carbon electricity. Uh, that is nuclear, biomass, solar, wind and hydro. Uh, so all forms of low carbon generation. And this is, again, just to remind people, it's added up on a daily basis. So this is not what people many people might be used to is looking at an hourly or half hourly sub daily data. This is adding it all up to a, a, a daily basis. So one of the things here or a couple of the things, um, there's a, a long term declining trend in terms of the amount of electricity that uh, Great Britain is using. It's on uh, you know a, a slight downward trend. And we can see from the beginning to the end, there's a significant increase in low carbon electricity. So you know we're doing genuinely well at a Great Britain level in terms of um, it's been above 50 percent on an annual basis since 2019 in terms of low carbon electricity. That has uh, been a success story. Um, the dotted line on here now at the bottom is the 100 gigawatt hours from that's the amount of storage that is available to the electrical system at this point in time. So just for a sense of scale, that is it. So the line shows that if it's refilled on a daily basis. And if you're refilling on a daily basis, you're then into the question about where's the electrical energy coming from to refill that. So estimated at 100 gigawatt hours, as with all storage, it would need refilled once depleted. And depending on the time of year, day of the week, time of day, somewhere between about two, five hours of stored energy in the electrical system connected to the electrical system, pump storage, batteries, EVs, if they were V2G, and others such as liquid air, et cetera. So that, that's, if you're not using V2G, take a you know broad look at it, about one and a half to four hours of electrical demand. 
So how much storage is connected to the electrical system at this point in time? It's about one and a half hours or four hours, and that's non-fuel. So fuel makes a difference here. Coal, biomass, gas, and nuclear in particular. Uh, nuclear offers months and months of stored energy. We just don't know how much. I talked to the, I think it was chief exec of EDF uh, a couple of years ago, and it's, it's almost like a state secret. <laughs> but I, so I put it to him that basically, um, would there be about a year's worth of, uh, yeah, about a year's worth. And if they need more, they get it over from France, right? So it's kind of no problem. Um, but say a year's worth of that, but we don't actually know. Um, gas is increased, but coal is running down, coal is off the system clearly. So we're not gonna look at that. So that's the electrical system, one and a half to two hours of storage in the electrical system at this point in time, but non-fuel based. Let's have a look at the gas system. Right, so this is uh, data from uh, National Gas, and this is the opening stock of uh, all the gas um, facilities in Great Britain. Actually, Stuart, just to point out, none of this is in Scotland, right? It's, I don't think there is any gas storage in Scotland. It could be wrong, but there's, um, that is something. Clearly, there's uh, pump storage in Scotland, but there's no gas storage. So all of this is in England um, and Wales. I don't think there's anything in, in Northern Ireland either. But the scale here is just to note um, we're into terawatt hours, tens of terawatt hours now uh, of, of scale. To point out a few things that happened. Um, uh, Well, it's okay. I'll just I'll talk to it. The blue line over the very large blue line on the left hand side, which disappeared between 2018 and 22. That was the rough. That was Great Britain's only seasonal form of um, gas storage uh, for various reasons. At the time, they decided that it wasn't worth keeping open or rather government um, decided Westminster. Sorry, that is um, Whitehall decided um, it was more a market decision. And if the market couldn't uh, provide Centrica as it was, or is, couldn't uh, couldn't make the numbers work, then government weren't prepared to subsidize it to make the, it work. However, there's been a change of thought clearly after Ukraine and looking at resilience and security of supply rather, um, and rough is now back on the system again. Um, but that's the amount of energy is in stored uh, on a, uh, starting point effectively over that period of time. LNG is the uh, dark, or sorry, the grey at the bottom. Cavern storage is the light blue in the middle, and rough has come back on the system. Um, and it's got about uh, five terawatt hours, I think, in it at the moment. This is going back to uh, the original chart. The red line here is the same. The green line is the same, but we've had to expand the y-axis just to fit on the gas demand in Great Britain on a daily basis. So this is the stuff that goes to industry. It's basically all demand for natural gas other than export. So that is just Great Britain's energy demand. We can see there's a significant amount of seasonality there. Uh, I'm pointing out a couple of things. That's the beast from the east, um, very spiky at that day. What did we do? We used five terawatt hours on the day of the beast from the east a couple of years ago, just in terms of raw energy through the gas system. OK, so if we have extreme weather events uh, in, in the future, then these are the types. OK. then these are the types of events that energy system planners have to plan for. Um, but um, yeah, we can see that um, it's the most seasonal element in terms of the whole system. Any uh, energy uh, vector that Great Britain uses, uh, it's the gas demand, which itself is driven by uh, space heating demand, actually, um, that causes a problem. And space heating demand itself is driven by residential space heating demand. So that is the thing that causes the most seasonality of demand right across any of the energy vectors in, in Great Britain. Um, this is then if you take 
the amount of gas in storage and you divide it by the same day by this, which is the gas demand, on a daily basis, it gives you what is the amount of gas in storage as a, you know, a rough proxy effectively. And then rather than having it all on a daily basis, we've just looked at it, aggregated it over months to say, what was the average amount in storage over a month? What was the average de daily demand over a month? And this is what you get. So down in 2018, that was around about the uh, beast from the east. Um, it got a bit squeaky at that point, um, down to about two or three days worth of, of storage in, in, in gas. But over the last period of time, you know, just let's say, uh, going back to, this is days effectively, not hours now. So we're looking at days of energy stored uh, available to the gas system. And, you know, you choose whichever average you, you want to look at, but it's certainly much, much greater than one and a half to four hours, which is the equivalent on the electrical system. So we might say, look, it's somewhere seasonally. Um, we've been leaving more in storage, actually, and I think that's to do with security of supply and uh, arrangements from um, between Centrica and Ruff and others effectively of leaving stuff in just in case. Um, so, you know, somewhere between about five, 10 days, maybe. So that's five and 10 days as opposed to one and a half to four hours. So liquid fuels, let's do the same for liquid fuels now, but we'll reverse it back. We'll look at the storage at the end of this. Um, same figures, if you can see the red line and the green line um, from the same figure that we started with. This is for petrol, big drop off after lockdown has been coming back a little bit, but sitting around maybe 450 gigawatt hours a day, something like that. That's the amount of energy. Sorry, the reason it is blocky, this is statistics from Desnes and they publish it on uh, a monthly basis for a month. So all I do is then how many days in the month, take the monthly figure and divide it by that. And therefore we get this blocky uh, attempt at trying to work out what, what the demand was. Um, this is for diesel. Um, I was going to say with that, that's on a, a subtle sort of long term decline petrol. Looking at it looks like, you know, it, it's kind of peaked around there. So diesel itself might be dropping away. Um, aviation fuel, there is some seasonality to avi aviation fuel we can pick out visually, which we shouldn't be surprised about if we fly as a nation more in the summer than we do in the winter. Um, big, big drop off uh, because of lockdown. But that has come back uh, again. And if we add all them together, then we can see the impact of lockdown here very uh, clearly. And then we're back at around about, say, 1500 gigawatt hours a day, so three minutes. Um, we do the same here. That is basically this black line here is transposed to here because we need to extend the y axis up so much because this is the amount of liquid fuels in product form that is in final product form that is available in country at a national level so we're up around 40 terawatt hours if we divide one by the other again we're at this notwithstanding the sort of impact of covid which skewed the numbers we're broadly speaking around 20 to 30 days worth of storage now we look at just as a very quick point why do we store that? And one of the reasons is either through the IEA, which Great Britain or UK is a member of and was a member of the European Union. There are mandated um, aims because it's oil or crude oil or crude oil products to have a certain amount of that in country. If you want to be a member of the IEA, a stipulation is you have an X amount, I think it's 60 days or 90 days, say 60 days in country and there must be a reason for that. So that reason might be, well, if we don't have enough um, transport fuels, then there are bad things that happen on a societal basis, effectively. So every time there's a fuel shortage or a fuel shock, we can start to see the, the trends in that. And it's, it's, not, it's not particularly uh, pleasant from a government perspective to understand there's about to be a breakdown in society, okay? But, we have 20 to 30 days of petrol, diesel and fuels, but I don't think it's really hit the radar yet about, right, when we electrify this, are we going to have 20 to 30 days worth of electri electrified energy effectively 
to stop people rioting. Is, is that what we want? Is that the case? And I don't know. That's an open question. That is just petrol, diesel, that's end fuels. If we look at crude oil and other things at terminals and refineries and everything else, then we get up to the sort of 100 terawatt hour basis. So that's what we have kicking about in fuels available to the energy system at this point in time. Primary energy, each square here, when we add everything up, we get to this line at the top. So, you know, it's not just electricity, which is this red line that we need to keep Britain in business on a daily basis. We need the purple line at the top, which is broadly speaking somewhere between six and four terawatt hours a day over this you know, recent period of time. So that's what we need. If we don't have that, we have problems on the energy system. Um, each of these squares on this figure is 15 terawatt hours. So that puts things in perspective, just from a visual, visual point of view. Last couple of slides. Um, we, did, we have done really well to decarbonize the electrical system. But when we add all the primary energy up to this line at the top, and we say how much as a percent is from low carbon electricity, how much is from gas, how much is from liquid fuels, and we do it on a monthly basis, this is what we get. So all the effort that has gone into decarbonizing the electrical system over the last 10 years has got us to pretty much about 12, 13% of decarbonized energy or primary energy. And therefore, we've still got 80 odd percent to go to get to net zero. That's a big challenge, big, big challenge. Um, so why is storage critical element of low carbon energy systems? Regardless of the reduction in the overall need for stored energy, final use is increasingly electrified system will need to cope with back-to-back -back low wind events, potentially at times of year during the heating season. That sort of immediately puts you into the tens of terawatt hours of stored energy range, perhaps, you know, multiples of that. That could be nuclear, could be interconnections of low carbon electricity or gas, hydrogen storage within national boundaries, or low carbon energy imports of some sort of shipping. You know, there's a range of different things here that it's not just that we need to do everything by one method. Likely all of the options previous slide will be used as a portfolio approach because it has benefits in terms of thinking about it. it's not all eggs in one basket. And the presentations only really considered the scales of energy for Great Britain, but really interesting from a, a Scotland uh, government perspective about it's not just about Scotland, it's not just even about Great Britain, it's about Europe. And what happens if generation and storage within Great Britain's boundaries is an international service? OK, Scotland is a powerhouse, literally. Um, it's an open question. Very much looking forward to talks throughout today. Uh, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions during the break. Great, thank you very much, Grant. And uh, kept time more or less. That's good. Uh, do we have any questions on? I'll take one question from online, Richard, if there is one. If there isn't, well, we'll just pass on. No, right, that's great. Thanks. OK, so I'm just going to rampage on. Uh, and introduce uh, Nigel Holmes, based in Scotland, Scottish Hydrogen Fuel Cell Association, who is a fountain of all wisdom in all everything to do with hydrogen. If you want to know anything to do with hydrogen, then you drop an email to Nigel and you'll have an answer in five minutes. So Nigel's going to talk to us now about the role of hydrogen in the potential role in the whole energy system. Grant's outlined the storage attributes and Nigel will talk about perhaps a bit wider in the energy system. So over to you. Stuart, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, hope everybody can hear me in the room and also delighted to see, I think we've got about 55 people online at the moment. Um, some people I've not seen for years. Um, Alistair Reddy is one of the people online. He actually did a lot of the early work to raise the awareness of hydrogen as part of the decarbonised energy system in the UK. So thank you, Alistair, for that uh, groundwork that you did. Um, so as with the other speakers, there's quite a few slides. They will be available afterwards um, and we'll be going through, again, quite, quite a lot of ground here. Um, but uh, break, yeah, time during the break for, for discussion. Now, 
what I'd like to tell you about now is, so uh, Stuart started off with some of the policy context. Grant's followed this up with some you know, great insights about the, the changing nature of the, the UK energy system. And I'd like to home in on Scotland and also start to think about <clears throat> some of the, the locational aspects of energy. So Grant covered the, you know, sort of the type of energy use as well as the, the time of use and the type of use. There's also a question of where does the energy come from and where does the energy get used? And it's actually how you start to draw all of this together, time, place and type of use. Um, so Scotland's got some very, very strong ambitions. Stuart, you set the, the profile on that. Um, and this is very much looking at how large scale hydrogen storage, storage as gas, will actually allow us to integrate renewables better into the energy system and make use of those uh, that stored energy, in particular when you're looking at seasonal variations like heat demand in, in winter. So one of the things you didn't put up, Stuart, was this brilliant underground map. This was developed by the Scottish Government as part of the, um, the energy strategy. Um, I really like this one because it gives you a sense of the, the threads running through the energy system, the complexity of the energy system, and where things start to intersect. You know, so for example, the use of um, solid or gas uh, fuels for heat or power generation. Um, so you're moving essentially from the supply of energy on the left to the use of energy on the right. And it, in the middle, it picks up, and this is the map from, I think, 2020. So there's no established hydrogen um, or you know, production or demand, no established um, hydrogen storage, but there is the pump storage. Uh, so that's been in place in Scotland for many years. And I think we've got most of the UK's 30 um, gigawatt hours of, of pumped hydro storage. You know, Dinora you know, kicks in, but we've got quite a bit of it up here in Scotland, hopefully more, more of that to come as well. Well, the Norig in, in Wales, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I'll come back to that because there is actually another version of that for the, the mid 2030s, and you'll see how the, cha the change of that energy system as we go forward. Um, just to reiterate, um, you know, so Stuart, you know, thank, this is actually, I think, an older version of your, your slide, um, but it brings, again, the potential impact in terms of jobs. So the estimates for 2045 range from 70,000 to over 300,000 jobs and the GVA, very big numbers for GG, GVA, um, as Stuart said, you know, potentially larger than the GVA from the existing uh, oil and gas sector uh, to Scotland. So economically, it's really important. Um, Scotland has already achieved some, some great progress with decarbonisation of electricity supply. Um, this has been primarily achieved through uh, renewables, wind, onshore wind's been the, the main um, growth area and it's shown this graph on the left. Uh, shows the um, numbers in 2020. But you, you might say, well, that's great. You, you've got all this renewables. You've done that. You've decarbonised electricity. The point now is that there will be need for more renewables because electricity is only about one quarter of the, the total energy demand in Scotland. Another quarter comes from transport. There's about another quarter from uh, residential um, energy demand, primarily heat, and another quarter from industry. So if you're going to decarbonise not just electricity, but transport and heat and industry, you're going to need more energy coming in. So you're going to need about four times the amount of renewable energy generation than we have at the moment. Where does that come from? Well, it's going to be a mixture of onshore wind. So onshore is probably the quicker one to actually scale up. And the Scottish Government has a target for an additional about 10 gigawatts of onshore wind by 2030. Um, then there'll be need for more on offshore wind. Again, the Scottish Government has a target for about 10 gigawatts by 2030. But it doesn't stop there. There's actually a lot more to come with some of the leasing of the areas of sea around Scotland. This is called the Scotwind leasing. There's also another one called Intog. Um, and you know, the, these uh, slides from Deepwind, so deep, the Deepwind cluster you know, represents a lot of the activity happening in this area, shows you some of the um, capacity offshore that is actually operational, but also what's under construction. So the orange, the consented, the yellow, and what's coming through with, with further leases in, in blue. And you can see that it's it's all around Scotland, um, mainly to the east of Scotland, still fairly close to shore. And being close to shore, you can actually get quite a bit of this is um, the actual mounted on the seabed. As you start to move further out, you start to see more uh, developments considering the floating of offshore wind. And back in August last year, 
there was an announcement from the Crown Estate Scotland about the leasing of areas around Scotland and a total of about 28 gigawatts of um, capacity has been leased. So it doesn't mean to say it's been um, actually approved or will, will be built, but it's been uh, leased. And what you see on this one is the, um, the ones in blue are essentially mounted on the seabed. The ones in green, that's his floating offshore wind. So you can see that the floating offshore is becoming much more dominant. And the pattern is the further you get away from the shore, the more likely it is to be offshore, uh, floating offshore because of the depth of, of the seabed. It also potentially means that um, some of the floating offshore could be a stronger contender for hydrogen production. And, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, then there's an, another one that came out uh, last year, which is, I don't know, it's Jan January this year, INTOG uh, was released, about another five gigawatt. This is linked to the decarbonisation of offshore oil and gas facilities. And all of this is floating, floating wind. So you start to put it together, you've got a massive opportunity. Where does this fit with hydrogen production? There's a lot of um, companies now looking at floating offshore wind with hydrogen. Uh, there's various ideas about, do you use the floating offshore wind, bring the electricity back to the shore and produce the hydrogen onshore? Or do you start to put, um, for example, rigs offshore with electrolyzers, or do you put the electrolyzers on the actual floating offshore um, wind generation platforms? Dolphin is an example of the latter. You integrate hydrogen production with the floating offshore wind platform. Pretty much means you can put it into place wherever you want it, get it all anchored to the seabed, and then you can start producing the hydrogen. You don't need an electrical connection going back to the shore. You do need a pipe. But one of the good things about the North Sea is actually there's quite a few pipes already. Um, and some of these could get reused for hydrogen production and transportation. So this is all about when we start to look at energy. It's a question of where you produce it and how you move it could actually be critical. And also then how you integrate that into the energy system. So this just shows some a couple of the pipelines which have been used for oil and gas in the past. These are actually a couple of these are lined up for use, use for CO2, uh, transporting CO2 offshore for offshore CO2 storage. But potentially some of this and some of the other pipes could be reused for, for hydrogen transport or they could be new pipelines going in. And why, why does this matter? So coming back to this question of integrating energy. A lot of the renewable capacity um, potential uh, for the UK actually sits in Scotland or in Sc Scottish waters. Uh, the challenge is, in two minutes to finish this one off, um, is to actually move that energy from, from where you make it to where you use it. And this is where interconnectors could be a bit of a barrier. Um, so as well as interconnectors, the wires, start to consider the use of pipes to move the hydrogen so you get that additional capacity and then start to overlay that with storage. So can you start to use pipelines together with um, storage, large scale storage, potentially offshore? And that's actually where the reuse of old gas fields could be really important. And you start to move towards the concept within the you know, Scottish government's updated um, vision for, for, the, uh, for the 2030s, where within all of this, in the middle, you've got you know, hydrogen storage playing a much more important part. Um, you've got distributed electrolysis producing the hydrogen. You've got um, renewable electrolysis potentially offshore. There is one bit that was missing from that, that chart, and I've actually taken the, the, I've been presumptuous, I put it in. It's actually power to X. It, it's a, it's a, an approach, power to X um, is actually being led, I would suggest, by Denmark. The Denmark hydrogen strategy is called a power to X strategy. Uh, and this is about taking hydrogen and using a feedstock for making, it could be low carbon liquid fuels, it could be ammonia. And this is a way of starting to integrate more energy from renewables into the future energy system. How much capacity do you, might you need with the, the, the hydrogen storage? Well, it's quite handy. Um, the future energy um, scenarios have just been published this week. Monday they came out. Um, there's a range of scenarios, but in the system transformation scenario, they're looking at the amount of hydrogen storage capacity actually increasing to probably about 56 terawatt hours by 2050. Uh, this is the chart on, on the right here. Uh, the, the pale blue is actually the system transformation scenarios. So this could be really important in terms of how you start to integrate the energy that's produced renewables with the demand for, um, it could be for production of um, chemicals, industry and seasonal uh, demand for heat. Um, there is another report that came out which I recommend it's by the Committee on Climate Change, came out in March, and this is about how the UK meets its uh, target for being 
net zero electricity by 2035, so that all of the UK's electricity is net zero by 2035. And the challenge there, again, is a seasonal one. How do you actually meet that um, peak demand? Grant mentioned it when you get periods of low wind, no wind, um, long periods of time, where's the energy going to come from? Again, hydrogen storage is one of the key answers there. <clears throat> so the final thing I just want to touch on is some of the ways that people look at the energy system. Um, the classic way of looking at energy um, is through the energy trilemma. How do you get the balance between cost of energy, security of energy supply and the environmental impacts? And the answer is it's very challenging. You can sometimes do two, very rarely get all three. And some of the other approaches, which, for example, is the, yeah, Michael Liebrich's um, proposed you know, hydrogen ladder, um, looking at you know, what they think is unavoidable compared to what they think is uncompetitive. And actually, right down in the bottom on the right, uh, Michael puts you know, power system, you know, sort of power system uh, balancing as being that's the last thing you want to do. So it's a bit like Stuart's comment at the start. You know, when people started talking about storing hydrogen, a lot of people say, why would you want to do that? And then later on, they realize, actually, if you're going to make things work properly, this is what you need to do. It might not be the most efficient. It probably won't be the cheapest. But if you actually want to keep the lights on and make sure that you're warm and the industry keeps going in the winter, then this is going to be absolutely essential. Grant, you mentioned Europe. And just to close off a couple of slides to, to show where this all starts to fit, um, basically, the renewable resources and the demand for energy across Europe are not evenly balanced. A lot of the demand that you get, for example, sits in the, the middle of Germany or Netherlands and ben, uh, um, the Benelux area. A lot of the production of renewables could be uh, Spain with solar, um, Ireland, Scotland with, with wind. The challenge is how you capture that energy and you move it from basically where it's produced to where you need it. Um, and again, this has been recognized in Europe, the Ostend Declaration, which came out back in April. Um, and the um, Hydrogen Council have also identified around the world basically how you store and move hydrogen. Um, regional hydrogen demand is more likely to be moved by pipelines, gaseous hydrogen, rather than converting it into ammonia and using similar you know, ammonia or similar you know, energy carriers. And what that means in practice is that as Europe starts to develop its what they call the, the European hydrogen backbone, the backbone of large transmission gas pipelines, the motorways, as Stuart describes them, um, the opportunity is for these, these back, this backbone to start to actually transmit that energy around Europe. And the key thing to consider here is where does the storage sit? You know, can the storage sit in Scotland? Might it be in other parts of the North Sea? Could it be in um, you know, Holland, um, you know, Germany, Denmark? I think the answer is likely to be all of the above. You know, the storage will be distributed and the, the demand will be distributed as well. So uh, just to wrap up, um, yeah, you know, this is very much about looking at the, the energy system, thinking about how it's going to evolve in the future, how the demand for energy will evolve in the future as well, particularly around the seasonality, thinking of meeting the, the peak demand for heat um, and, and you know, energy in the winter, and how hydrogen can play a massive part in actually delivering that security of energy supply and decarbonisation. Stuart, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks very much, Nigel. That's great. That's a really clear graphic ex explanation of where hydrogen sits. I'm going to say, have we got opportunity for one question from the audience? Anybody got that hand now? Two hands online, so we'll take one of the online questions. Dial that up. Um, Bob Barnes online. I've just allowed mic access. Uh, please unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Yeah, hi, hi, Nigel. That's very interesting. Well, the whole morning's been very interesting, in fact. Um, you showed, uh, sorry, I'm from the Environment Agency, by the way. You showed uh, a map suggesting that the capacity or potential for hydrogen uh, production is really Scotland and there's none in England. Now, is that actually just a matter of um, get my words out, a matter of um, our willingness to embrace hydrogen production, or is it simply about where the, where the wind's blowing more? So Bob, um, no, the, the, the map I showed was very much just focused on the, um, on the Scottish um, 
potential for renewable electricity production, uh, focusing on, um, in particular, the offshore wind uh, around Scottish waters. Um, it is absolutely fair to say that there is a big offshore wind opportunity for uh, many other areas of the North Sea, southern parts of the North Sea, um, off, off the east of England. Um, and I think the, the potential there you know, is probably getting close to the equivalent of what we would have in, in Scotland. Um, and obviously, that is that is closer to the demand points in the south of England, you know, London and the South East. Um, so as the Scottish Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association, we tend to concentrate on the, the opportunity in, in Scottish waters. But what I would say is that the, the big challenge between uh, producing the energy in Scotland and the potential demand in England is this, in, in terms of the power networks, is this B6 boundary. It's actually getting the electricity from north of Hadrian's Wall to south of Hadrian's Wall and the capacity of those interconnectors. So um, the, the answer is, yes, there is a lot more um, offshore renewable uh, generation capacity in England. Um, a lot of the um, quick wins in Scotland are probably to do with onshore um, you know, wind generation. And I don't see the same appetite for scaling up onshore wind uh, in England. Um, I think last year there was only about five megawatts of offshore wind, uh, onshore wind connected in England. Um, you know, so th th there's a big difference both in terms of the, the the wind yield potential and the appetite for for wind comparing Scotland to Scotland to England. But I think together, you know, is the is the way we need to look at it. Brilliant. Thank you, Nigel. A question from the room, anybody? Question from the room. So uh, at the risk, well, go to the second question online, and hopefully the second question can also be brief, and the answer can be brief because we're we've got coffee. Catherine Daniels, your microphone is now allowed. Please unmute yourself. Thanks very much. Uh, Catherine Daniels, Cardiff University. Thanks, Nigel, for the talk. I noticed that you had a hydrogen ladder showed on one of your slides towards the end of your talk, and I thought it was interesting that domestic heating was low down, uh, and I just wondered what your perspective was on how Scotland will deal with decarbonisation of domestic heating um, and energy for its extremely rural communities that are unconnected to the grid? So the, the quick answer is that um, yeah, rural communities are probably much less well suited to using you know, hydrogen for decarbonising heat. Um, just because, as Stuart's described, a lot of the work that's been done recently is about <clears throat> converting the existing gas networks from being you know, cast iron to polyethylene. Um, I think the the real opportunity to look at for you know, using hydrogen in, in, in domestic heating is, as Stuart said, it's looking at the properties, the older properties, which are less energy efficient, much more difficult and expensive to make um, energy efficient, and how that might work, um, especially in areas where you've got large scale local hydrogen production. And the key here will be actually to try and get the cost of the hydrogen down so that the cost of the energy is, is very competitive with other forms of low carbon heating. Um, this, this isn't about you know, sort of trying to pick a winner between you know, sort of, uh, you know, using heat pumps or using hydrogen boilers. It's about giving uh, people, the consumers, the choice between the different types of uh, system and making sure that the costs are competitive. The, the other key point with you know, hydrogen for heat as well is that even with heat pumps, this comes back to the energy storage challenge. If they're running on electricity, then you need the hydrogen storage in actually, actually to provide that responsive power generation to keep the heat pumps running, even, even if you're not using hydrogen for boilers. Right, that's it, okay. Thank Thanks you. very much, Nigel. I'm gonna draw a line on that because we're 20 minutes late, uh, so that's great. Thanks uh, to uh, Grant and to Nigel and to Stuart Mackay for uh, introducing the whole system and explaining it this morning, so that's great. And all of them will be around. OK, welcome back to round two out of four. Uh, traditionally, in lots of uh, energy developments of new infrastructure, the uh, perception of the residents and the people who live there is usually stuck in at the end of the meeting while the technical people are on their way out the door. But it's clear that again and again and again, people's perception of do we want this? What is it? What does it actually mean for us? That perception is a key blockage to most of the most of the developments in uh, 
in new energy infrastructure. So we've deliberately put this section in here as a lead in part of the uh, of the meeting. So we've got uh, our first talks up uh, from Arlen Harris of Ballard and Ballard have been doing uh, communication to school children in Fife as part of the H100 project. So that will be at least part of the talk. So I'll hand over now for half an hour to explain it. Fantastic. Thank you, Stuart. I'm actually just going to set a stopwatch going as I'm very, very bad at running over at these types of things. Um, thank you all for uh, having me today. Uh, my name is Alan Harris. I'm head of education at Ballard UK. Um, I have been um, delivering education uh, and outreach programs for over 10 years um, as Ballard and previously um, as Arcola Energy. Uh, so when I started with the company, there was only four of us. Oh, I'll shout louder. Is that better? OK, I'm used to being in front of room full of children, so I do have quite a good shouting voice, but I will attempt to not scream in your faces too much. Um, so the company uh, began life um, doing essentially very small, slightly weird fuel cell based projects. Um, so some of those that you might have heard of. Uh, so um, if you've ever seen James May's Toy Stories, uh, there was a an episode of that in which they produced little tiny trains and did a big train race. Uh, we produced the hydrogen fuel cell train for that uh, for that episode. Um, we were also produced a fuel cell range extended e-bike um, that cost about eight thousand pounds if you wanted to buy one. So as you can imagine, not many people were that keen on that one. Um, and we also did various kind of small lighting systems uh, for theatrical productions um, and lab systems for universities. Um, over the years, we became highly regarded um, as a system integrator. So we would spec systems for specific applications, um, work with OEMs to implement fuel cells um, into their trains, buses, refuse collection vehicles, whatever you can imagine. Um, and whilst we were our Kohler Energy, we were often using um, Ballard fuel cells. Um, so in 2021, um, we were actually acquired by Ballard uh, Global, uh, which really made sense as we've been using their products for a long time and had a very kind of good working relationship with them. Um, and, uh, and of course, Ballard have continued to do our education work um, after acquisition, which I was very happy about and a little bit terrified about in many ways as well. Um, so we've also been um, delivering education for over 10 years. So within about a year of setting up the company, we started our, our education program. Um, it's essentially a solo operation. So I'm a bit of a kind of one man band. For those of you who have met me before, I tend to be running around normally in a van full of various hydrogen based toys. Uh, we run this department as not for profit um, and very often for loss. Uh, but I guess this is something that really shows um, at my CEO's dedication to education. Um, you know, not many companies set up an education department when there are only four employees um, and when you're very, very young. Uh, traditionally, we funded this through a variety of means. Um, so using our dissemination budgets from various funded projects um, to, to run these education pieces. Um, and part of the reason for this is that very, very early on when we started doing funded projects, um, you always have to put a percentage of that money towards communication and dissemination. Um, and we found that what we were doing was very ineffective. So we would often hire out a local town hall. We would invite the public in to tell them about the technology that we were installing in their local area. Um, and we found that we would have maybe three or four people turn up. None of them would know what we were talking about. And most of them would just think that we were the local government and want, would want to complain to us about potholes and things like that. Uh, so we found it was much more effective to, to kind of direct that money into education um, and really educating young people, going around schools in a local area and getting lots and lots more young people kind of excited about this technology. And then hopefully going home to their parents and shouting at them about how they've been playing with uh, highly flammable gases in their, uh, in their school lessons. Um, so we have a number of different services that uh, I provide. Um, so we have the Hydrogen Challenge, which is our flagship activity that we've been running for over 10 years, um, 10 years of development. 
Um, this can be delivered in a number of different ways. So it's really, really flexible. Uh, most of the time we deliver this as a structured workshop, but I also can deliver at large science, fest science festivals and expos and things like that. Um, I've also delivered that for universities, um, company team building exercises, training days, bring your child to work day, birthdays, weddings, bar mitzvahs, and, uh, so <laughs> none of that. Uh, we also deliver the Hydrogen Challenge as a much larger schools-based competition, so delivering across an entire city or region, or uh, in the case of Scotland, an entire country. Um, uh, and those tend to culminate in a final event where we're bringing together all the different stakeholders um, who've been involved in those projects um, and giving that kind of focal point, getting local government involved, getting all of our sponsors in there, um, and of course, getting all the kids who've taken part um, and really um, giving them prizes getting them really excited about uh, about this technology. Um, we can also provide consultation. So over the years, we've um, consulted on um, actually producing equipment, um, what off the shelf products are good and what is not. Having worked in this um, sector for a very long time, I can tell you that most off the shelf fuel cell STEM kits are not particularly good, um, as I'm sure many of you know who work with fuel cells. Fuel cells are an expensive technology, so a £30 or £60 STEM kit is not going to have particularly good fuel cells included. Um, I can also do lectures and things like that at science festivals and at events like this. Um, and we do sometimes hire out our equipment to third parties who can also um, deliver our workshop or at least use our equipment for their own means. Um, although we have a really, really big focus on making sure that the quality of what's being delivered is maintained. Um, it's very, very easy to just let that kind of fall to the wayside. Um, so the Hydrogen Challenge, which I was just speaking about. So this is a one and a half to two hour workshop in which participants build a hydrogen fuel cell car from Lego components using a real hydrogen fuel cell, real hydrogen supply. Um, and the the idea is to really build a vehicle that is as energy efficient as possible. So one that goes as far as it can on a very limited supply of hydrogen. Um, the workshop includes a presentation which covers a whole bunch of subjects. However, the activity itself is really mechanical engineering, um, gears, ratios, balancing, kind of speed and power and all those types of things. Um, and we've often found that actually the, the kind of perception of hydrogen and fuel cell, fuel cell technology is very, very bad within education, mostly due to um, the education and STEM kits that are being provided to these schools. Um, they want something that's cheap and off the shelf that they can use, but often those, product, those products will only last for maybe two or three uses before they essentially just end up in the bin. Um, our equipment is considerably more expensive than the stuff that you would get off the shelf. So a single set of my equipment that's used to deliver a, a workshop with a group of maybe 30 participants costs about £5,000. Um, and in fact, the fuel cells that we use, which are, look a little bit like this, uh, each one of these, if you were to be buying it at cost, would cost you about £300. Um, so they are really quite expensive bits of tech. Um, and we found that it was that delivering workshops in this way was a much more effective way of showing what this technology can do um, and getting some really kind of high quality equipment into these schools. Um, so we have delivered all over the place, uh, so all over the all over the UK as well as internationally. Um, we delivered um, alongside Edinburgh Science Festival um, in the United Arab Emirates um, many many times over the years. Um, so. For those who don't know, uh, Edinburgh Science Festival actually runs um, Abu Dhabi Science Festival. Um, so we've delivered in Dubai, Abu Dhabi and Sharjah um, with them over the years. Uh, we also delivered a very large education program in Indonesia in 2018, supporting the Asian Games, where we traveled around various locations over the course of a month um, and delivered to about 4,000 young people across Indonesia. Uh, the reason for that was that at the Asian Games, uh, this was when uh, Japan had just found out that they were going to get the Olympics. Um, Indonesia and Japan, for some reason, don't like each other very much. Um, and so Indonesia decided that they wanted to be the first ones to have hydrogen um, mobility at their big sporting event. Uh, so they went and did that before Japan could do it. Um, and luckily we were brought in to do that as well. So we had hydrogen vehicles being flown into Indonesia as well as this education program running around for a month. Um, 
So a couple of um, case studies. So um, last year, year before last, um, I went out to South Africa to go um, and do the comms piece around the rollout of uh, Anglo-Americans massive mining truck, which you can see just at the top of the screen there. Uh, so that's the largest hydrogen vehicle ever produced. Um, it's kind of hard to really get the scale of it from here, but each of those wheels is about 12 foot across, so um, about double my height. It's very, very large. Um, and we were brought in by Anglo-American and First Mode, who actually did the conversion of that vehicle um, to go around the local schools. And it's really explained to them why this um, why this technology is so important. Um, and we were actually doing this at the platinum mine where the platinum is being mined that goes into the fuel cell industry. Um, so we were really going around and explaining to these young people why essentially their local largest employer is so important to this global industry. Um, one that's much more applicable to now. Uh, so we've been delivering for the last three years the Scottish Schools Hydrogen Challenge. Um, this is a really large, the largest programme that we've ever delivered. So in 2021, this was supporting COP26. Um, we delivered seven regional competitions across the seven Scottish city regions. Um, lots and lots of workshops, very, as many finals as we could get in, COVID allowing. Um, and we had a large grand final at uh, Scottish Powers head offices in Glasgow. Um, this year and last year, we did our second um, run of this, uh, which then included Dunfermline as uh, Dunfermline suddenly became a city. Uh, and as you can see, we scaled that up a little bit, uh, much more workshops. We managed to get all of our finals done and a grand final. Um, this was supported by various industry partners um, across Scotland. Um, so some of the big ones were Storiga, the Scottish Cluster and Scottish Power, who are some of our bigger partners. But we also had a whole bunch of supporting partners who were supporting in particular locations. Um, what they get out of this, of course, is um, we're actually highlighting the hydrogen projects that those businesses are involved with at the time and promoting them to young people um, and really showing them that this is a potential employer in the future. Um, yes, uh, we're also currently getting ready to start funding for our third instalment of this programme. So if uh, if any of you are interested in having a conversation about, please, please do talk to me at the end. Um, and we actually obviously there is only one of me. Um, so I when I'm delivering these much larger programmes, um, I tend to get uh, third party facilitators and often uh, university students, a couple of whom are actually in the room today, uh, to come and deliver those workshops. Um, so we've been running um, with that kind of format since about 2016. Um, so we offer the opportunity to um, undergraduates, graduates, researchers and often um, professionals from our partners um, to come and get delivered in facilitating these workshops. Um, Part of the reason that we do that um, is really comes from my personal experience of delivering education to young people. Uh, so when I first started doing this, my first ever workshop, I was thrown in at the deep end in an East London secondary school, pretty rough area. If anybody knows East Ham, it's uh, not the most uh, affluent area, let's put it that way. Um, and it was the most terrifying experience of my life. Um, I was sweating and shaking in front of a room full of teenagers who looked very bored with what I was talking about. Um, but obviously over the years, having done this for many, many times, I feel it's really improved my ability with public speaking and my own kind of confidence in talking about what I do. Um, and, we've, and I often find that university students and people who are doing very technical subjects, this is something that they really find very difficult. Uh, you know, they're all doing really interesting, amazing stuff, but actually communicating that to young people and to the general public is actually a real skill. It's very, very hard once you have the technical knowledge of something to talk about it in layman's terms. Um, so obviously every time that we do this, we pay our students, uh, we're connecting those students with potential employers through the partner professionals that are getting involved as well as our sponsors. Uh, as you can see, we've worked with a whole bunch of universities over the years. Um, and for our Scottish Schools Challenge, we are essentially working with every university um, in the locations where we're delivering, um, which has gone fantastically well. And we get a really, really good response every year. Uh, in fact, 
this time round or the last time round, we were actually oversubscribed in a couple of areas, um, which was a little bit difficult when you've got only two weeks of workshops um, and 20 people wanting to get involved in the facilitation of those. Um, when we deliver our larger programs, of course, um, we do have to have some responsibilities that are taken off of my back. Um, before this, I used to go and stay on location. So I, I delivered a um, Aberdeen Schools Challenge, as, as Nigel will know, in 2019, uh, where I lived in Aberdeen for two weeks, went and delivered every single workshop, um, led every single one, did all the administration for it, all of the funding, set up the final, all of that kind of stuff. Um, however, for a large scale project like we've been doing across Scotland over the last couple of years, some of those responsibility, responsibilities need to be taken up by somebody else. Um, so we've developed a model now um, where we essentially have different stakeholders taking different responsibilities. So we at Ballard are obviously central logistics. We have all the equipment. I do all the training. Um, I look after running the final events, um, buying lots and lots of prizes for kids, which is obviously a terrible thing for me to be doing. Uh, we get local education institutions or STEM organisations in to provide facilitators. Um, so this is most of the time universities, but in areas where there are no universities, um, such as in Perth and Kinross, uh, we get third party STEM providers involved um, and of course pay them to deliver our work. Um, and even the teams where they, they are primarily university students, we always make sure that they've got a STEM professional who is looking after them um, whilst they're going around and delivering. I'm going to try and ignore that look from you, Hannah, of the, the professional that I gave you to, uh, to deliver in Edinburgh. Um, we get our local authority, our local authorities involved. Um, they're the ones who contact the schools, do all of the schools communications, any kind of travel logistics, anything like that. Obviously, if I was dealing with contacting several hundred schools, I might find that quite difficult in terms of my inbox on a daily basis. Uh, we ask our local authorities to provide us um, with a training venue, sometimes with a venue for our final events as well, free of charge. Um, however, what they're getting from this, of course, is a final event where they can bring their city leader along and have him shaking hands and kissing babies and all that kind of stuff. Um, as well as uh, providing this kind of focal point for these deliveries. Um, we also are providing all of our workshops to schools free of charge. Um, we have never charged a school for a workshop um, unless it's in very, very particular circumstances. Um, and of course, we get our local businesses involved. They're providing the financial backing. Um, they also can contribute content to the workshop. So we adapt our presentation every time it's delivered for the specific location. Um, and they can get their employees involved in, uh, in, in the actual delivery. And of course, some branded goodies at our final events um, and speakers as well to give out those prizes. Um, oh, I'm getting through this very quickly. Excellent. Um, so over the years, we've worked with loads of different um, partners and clients. Um, so we delivered with Toyota and Anglo-American um, at New Scientist Live and at a couple of different science festivals over the years doing our exact hydrogen challenge, but as a drop-in activity with often thousands of participants a day. I think our current highest is about 6,000 participants in a single day, uh, so it's quite a lot. Uh, we've also worked with Shell at the Eco Marathon and at their Make the Future Festival uh, for a number of years. Um, Scottish Power, of course, are sponsoring the Scottish Schools Challenge. Um, and we did used to deliver a London Schools Hydrogen Challenge um, alongside the Mayor of London. Um, however, change of government made, made that funding disappear. Um, and of course, BOC, um, Lindy, who are really, really big in the hydrogen sector. We've done loads of projects with them um, over the years. Um, so some statistics for you. Uh, so, so far uh, over the years, we have delivered to delivered hands on education face to face um, with over 125,000 young people. We don't do anything digitally. We do not do websites or videos or online lectures or anything like that. There is enough of that already on the Internet. Um, really, we want to put this technology into the hands of young people. You know, there's no there's no better example of this technology being safe um, than having young people playing with it in their classrooms. Um, we've delivered lots and lots of lectures, had hundreds of students get involved in our deliveries um, and lots of these large scale deliveries over the years, mainly um, based in the UK. But we're now starting to, as we become 
more integrated into the Ballard global of family. Uh, we are doing much more international stuff. So uh, my order book for next year is slightly terrifying. Um, and we have a really, really big focus on making sure that we collect feedback from all of our participants and our teachers to make sure that we are offering something that makes sense in terms of um, what's on the national syllabus, making sure that we are essentially covering everything around hydrogen fuel cells within that kind of two hour space. Um, cool. Um, so the impact of this. So why do Ballard continue to do this um, when it is not a money making venture? You know, they are a commercial company who are definitely sales driven in a lot of ways. Um, so obviously educating young people um, is a nice thing to do. Um, you know, we're encouraging, we're informing these young people about this really exciting sector um, that potentially, you know, these, poten these young people are potentially going to be our future workforce. Having done this for 10 years, I'm sure there are many young people who I worked with in my first couple of years who are now entering the job market or have been in it for a number of years who are now potentially um, thinking about fuel cells and hydrogen as a sector that they might want to go into. Um, we have uh, designed our workshops um, to really have a big focus on, on equity, diverse, diversity and inclusion. Um, so something that I've worked very hard on with the workshops themselves is to make sure that it's something that levels the playing field in terms of academic ability. You know, there's loads of STEM competitions and STEM days out there for those real high achievers. Um, and for a lot of those young people who don't get invited to those events, um, it can feel a little bit like they're not, you know, they're kind of being left out. They may be not smart. And often I think actually that lots of these young people learn just in a slightly different way. You know, we have this really big focus on digital skills and coding and all that kind of stuff at the moment, which is fantastic and we absolutely should. Um, but there are many young people out there who just can't learn that way. You, you put them in front of a computer screen and their brains just turn off. You know, and a lot of these young people, what they're missing now in education is that more tactile, hands on stuff, gears, building little cars and things like that. It's a really, really good way of showing these basic kind of maths and physics principles in a way that young people can understand and then potentially take that information and kind of start to build on it over time. Um, yes, um, we ha also um, are very, very pleased uh, to, to find that a lot of the time with our larger competition, uh, large competitions, it is uh, teams of girls that do particularly well. In fact, our current world record uh, distance for our car to go, it was held by what now must be a group of 20 something year old girls who at the time were 15, um, who managed to get a little tiny Lego fuel cell car to go 65 meters on 6.5 milliliters of hydrogen. So a single tiny little syringe. Uh, that's about double what we normally see in our workshops. Um, although this being said, their teacher was an ex Johnson Matthey fuel cell engineer. So obviously she, she knows something about fuel cells that maybe I don't know. Um, obviously this is a fantastic way of doing community engagement. Um, so, See, I spoke about bringing people into town halls. It's much more effective having this as something which is being highlighted in local media, having lots, lots of young people getting excited about it. Um, and by extension, their, their parents, you know, obviously adults in general are very, very busy. Uh, sitting them down and telling them about hydrogen and fuel cells is not really going to work in many situations. Uh, it's much more effective having these kids come home and scream at them about what they've been doing in class and then parents maybe being a little bit concerned about what they're being told but then finding out when they as they find about found out more about it i think a lot of those worries are, are kind of alleviated by actually seeing what this is and how much fun it is for the, for the young people involved um obviously we're also kind of getting really cross-sector engagement so we're strengthening the bonds with our partners um, we're connecting them with potential employees through our through our, our facilitators through the uni students getting involved and also getting city leaders talking to those um, those partners as well um, and this can really help to alleviate kind of 
I guess, community friction in a lot of ways. Um, you know, the general perception of hydrogen within the in the kind of general population is that it is a highly flammable, scary substance that should not be allowed anywhere near vehicles. Um, and I think this is a really, really good way of showing, of kind of getting rid of those fears um, of the general public uh, and making sure that when you do put these, this technology in into particular locations that you're not immediately getting a really, really big pushback from the local community. Uh, when I actually first started many, many years ago, um, there was a refueler installed, um, not in central London, but a lot further into London than had been before. Um, it was fairly near a block of flats. And as soon as the residents of that block of flats found out that it was there, uh, they immediately uh, petitioned to have it removed um, and they, was, they were successful. It had to be removed very, very soon after it had just been set up. Um, and that's something obviously that we want to avoid as much as possible. Um, I've got five minutes left. I'm going to try and keep this fairly uh, swift. Uh, obviously, from the commercial side, obviously, this is a revenue generating marketing um, activity. Um, it doesn't generate a huge amount of, of revenue, but we do try and cut even at least um, every year. Um, but that's really not the point of this. And, and my personal opinion is that is that if you are doing education and making money out of it, you're probably not doing it very well. Um, education should not be a, a commercial activity. It should be something that you are doing to you know, create that future workforce, create interest in your in your sector. Um, one of the really one of the factors that influences the amount of sponsorship that we get and other businesses coming to us um, is that this does provide that kind of community benefit outcome for for these public procurements. Um, so, as I said before, you know, lots of these public pub publicly funded projects, they do have to have this community community benefit aspect of those deliveries. Um, and that's something that obviously we can now provide in house as Ballard. Um, so when we sell a fuel cell stack to somebody or sell them a in bit of integration assistance, we can also do uh, the kind of community engagement piece uh, alongside that, doing something that the company who's employed us knows is going to be of high quality, that we actually care about what we're doing. Um, lots and lots of, obviously now that STEM is kind of a bit of a buzzword in the general populace, there are lots and lots of STEM organizations who have popped up, who are essentially there to, to suck up this uh, community benefit money from these larger organizations um, and deliver kind of the minimum possible in lots of cases. Um, so that's something that we are really, really passionate about avoiding. Uh, you know, we don't want to be doing this just for the sake of it. We want to make sure that actually the young people are getting something out of it. They're enjoying what they're doing and learning about fuel cells whilst also maybe being inspired to just follow in a kind of engineering path in general. Um, so obviously, why would a why would a big company do this? Um, so obviously, yes, this is effective marketing, and obviously, I think I've been a little bit through this before. Um, we are adding value for our customers. Um, we are aligning with our values as a company um, and our own ESG strategy. Uh, for those who don't know, ESG is the new kind of term for CSR, so um, it's environmental social governance, which makes it sound a lot more serious than. Um, whatever corporate social responsibility looked like before. Um, so one of our um, company kind of taglines is here for life. Um, and that is something that we are really trying to do um, more and more with our education program. So when we set these larger competitions up, we want to keep them going year on year. I've got two minutes. I'll be very, very swift. OK. Um, and obviously it makes us look good. Um, our reputation is enhanced by doing this education stuff, um, having it in local media, getting people excited about it. Um, and of course, yeah, largely self-funded. Um, uh, this one is very, very long, so I won't read any of it out, but this is really um, all the different um, kind of groups that I think the program touches and the benefits that it provides for those groups. Um, so obviously we have the young participants taking part. We have we have university student participants who are often doing these workshops as part of their freshers week or maybe as, as part of the kind of first little bit of their undergraduate course. Um, we have adult participants, so I often, often deliver these at team building exercises um, and at uh, networking events and things like that. Um, families getting involved through our expos and science festivals um, and professionals through those uh, those training exercises and things like that. Um, we have our university student facilitators 
partner professional facilitators, that our councils getting involved, partners and clients, and of course just the global fuel cell industry. You know, I think actually it's it's really really interesting seeing all this kind of com these conversations that we're having today. Um, but at the end of the day, what we really need to get hydrogen out there is for public perception to change um, and for the general public to be pushing for this technology to be installed in, in their local local areas. Um, and if they continue to be terrified of this technology, then that's not going to happen very quickly. Um, if we have, you know, if there is political will to get this stuff moving, then it will happen a lot faster. Um, I hope at least, and I think we all hope as well. Um, so I think that brings me to the end. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, and I'd be pleased to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, hey, time for a quick question from the room. If anybody's got one, thumbs up. Hands up at the back. Yeah. Yes. Been known to you already. So to wait for a microphone. Oh. Could you say who you are as well, please, when you, when you get the mic? So it's uh, you and Doris, SSE Thermal. Uh, did you say you were going into the third phase of the rollout for this? Yep. So um, we are just about to send out the offer to, to partners and start bringing in additional partners for uh, delivery in 2024. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I've I've kind of had a lot of stuff being brought to me by the, the Canadian business. So um, Ballard is based in, in Vancouver. Uh, so they're very, very keen to do a bunch of stuff in North America. So we've had to push that one to the end of the year. Um, but yeah, we are just about to start funding again. Right. So are you saying you'll start doing the school sessions again towards the end of this year? Uh, towards the end of next year. Next year. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. That was just one time lane. So thank you. Anybody else? Anything online? No, nothing online. Thanks very much then. Aaron. Fantastic. That's great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You're sticking around for an hour or two. I should be for a little bit. If anybody does want to come and handle the fuel cell, handle a fuel cell or offer me massive amounts of money to run around educating kids. <laughs> Excellent plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next up, oh, we're going to go a bit more specific uh, with Eli uh, Graham from Scottish Gas Networks. We'll be talking about public engagement. I guess it's around the H100 projects in Fife. Yep. So we're coming down very specifically to being in Scotland now. So over to Elaine. So half an hour. Okay. Hello, everyone. So I'm Ailey. I am the customer and marketing manager for H100 and Fife. Um, and as introduced, I work for SGN. So today I want to talk about H100 Fife and growing that public engagement, public perception and public percep uh, acceptance sorry, of hydrogen in the leaving mouth community. So first of all, for anyone who doesn't know what H100 Fife is, following a nationwide search, Buckhaven and Dinbeath were chosen for the site of the world's first 100% green hydrogen for homes. A heating network, which is now affectionately known H105. We're using the offshore wind turbine in Fife Energy Park that was shown in one of the presentations earlier, the seven megawatt turbine to make the hydrogen that we need. Now, we already have an energy park there, which is wonderful. So on that site, we're building an entire production plant. It will have the electrolyzer and the storage tanks to store enough hydrogen for up to five days in the worst weather conditions to serve the public. It will be a newly built gas network, and this is where it might vary from some other trials that you guys might have heard about. So what we are going to do is put in place a parallel hydrogen gas network that 300 people will be able to opt into. Um, it will run past about a thousand houses that would be eligible. So about a third we're looking for. The homes which decide not to opt in will remain on their existing natural gas network with absolutely no change to them whatsoever. It's really important, and I can't stress this enough, to remember that H100 Fife is about customer sentiment. It's about customer acceptance of hydrogen in their homes. It's about delivering the evidence that Desnes have asked for and how we're going to do that. So customer sentiment is absolutely key. And if you don't 
know anything or haven't heard anything about customer sentiment, it varies slightly from what you might realise as customer satisfaction. So it's the measure which indicates feelings, opinions and attitudes towards something, anything. Think about where you go your weekly shop. Think about where you go on holiday. Think about the restaurants that you eat at. It's as simple as that. You, are, you make those decisions based on a feeling. You'll often think, you know, you could find somewhere cheaper to shop. You could find a cheaper restaurant to go to. Maybe it would be closer to home. It would be more practical. But realistically, you are making those decisions based on the feeling that you have when you go to whatever that is. So that's what we're measuring with H105. You'll recognise quantitative data. So 56% of customers said they would be more likely to do X. 25% of customers said this. That's the, the measurable, but what we are really looking for here is the feeling, the descriptive, the narrative. What emotions does it bring up when you talk to them about it? And I'm sure as you can understand with hydrogen, that can quite often be varied. So the research that we did, so we worked with partners Greener Kirkcaldy in the area initially to, to gather some information before we did anything at all in the network area. We wanted to understand where was public perception? What drove them? How do they feel about their current energy usage um, and methods of doing that? And if anything, what would they like to change? So I'm not going to read through every slide because some of them are quite wordy, but I suppose the key call outs and this is 81% of people in the leaving mouth area rank gas as their top heating preference. 81% of people we're working with. 93% of households were interested in heating that would reduce their own household's carbon emissions. Great news, great news. They want to do it, they like gas. We obviously did a little bit of research as well, just around about did it make any difference that they were so close to the energy park and it didn't broadly. So that was conducted in December 2009 to March 2020, when we all know the world fell apart for a little while. So fast forward to December that year, and almost 25% of households in that area were selectively self-disconnecting from the gas network. 25% of homes were choosing to use electric heaters instead of their central heating system because that is the financial position that they were in. It's quite a scary statistic, really. So we already knew that cost was a massive driving factor in the local area, but I suppose that really brings it home it will, all, or it still is to this day, the remaining determining factor in how leaving mouse residents will use their current heating system and then their willingness to replace that heating system. So if they don't have to, generally they won't. We took that um, research a little bit wider and worked in conjunction with Stonehaven and did a Scotland wide focus groups. So it came out of that that familiarity, stability and security of continuing to use gas was important to them. They want to keep the connection and changing gas is a really comfortable energy transition for people. They know what they like, they like what they know. And that's probably fair of most people in this room. 73% said that they support replacing their boilers with a greener alternative. Again, happy days, that's wonderful, that's what we all want to hear. But when asked if they would do it, that support drops to 32%. So that's what we call the action gap. And that's what we used to start the basis of what H100 was going to look like for its participants. So obviously there's been a massive amount of research done over and above and out with these, but I think these two slides give a really good indication of where the public are in the area that we're working in and the public are more broadly around, around Scotland. So the action gap is mitigated in H105. It is a cost neutral model for the trial. Customers will not pay anything to participate and will not be out of pocket for participating. So the key engagement principles, so certainty, like we said, provides a certain a certainty, even predictability and familiarity for a public who feel unstable. A stable progress, change into hydrogen is a natural and pragmatic step and, and they are and from their current customer offering and control, it provides control for homes and families. And like someone said earlier, it's about customer choice as well. So not forcing anybody into, into a method that isn't right for them or for their home. So the customer journey, 
Great products and services are made when the people who make them care about the people who use them. And that means that during every meeting, when we make any decision, and in every design and with every interaction, we will think about our customers first. We will think about the people in the homes that we will be serving first. And importantly as well, and I really want to point out, and I, I will talk about it um, in a couple of slides time, this isn't just about 300 homes. This is about a thousand homes a network's going to run past. It's about 5,000 homes that are in the area. It's about the 10,000 homes that are in Leavenmouth. And understanding and, and the other the, the wider public perception and understanding of what it is that they are taking part in, it's a really exciting thing for the network area, but it's a really exciting thing for the whole community to be a, a, a world leader really in this. But it's important that they understand what it is that's happening, how it's happening, and what benefits their community is getting from it. So like I said earlier, it absolutely does not cost to participate in H100 Fife. So for participants um, who sign up to the trial and who are successful in taking part, they will have their natural gas boiler, meter and any natural gas appliances replaced with brand new appliances in their home. They'll have free installation, free servicing and free maintenance until the trial ends in 2027. They'll receive £1,000 for taking part and played an important role in that journey to net zero. Hydrogen is going to be billed at the same unit price as natural gas and customers will retain the option to change supplier at any point. So for the sake of round numbers, if their bill is £100 a month just now and they can get it for 80, they retain that right to move and we will do all the work in the background with the suppliers to make sure that that customer's transitions over remains on hydrogen and receives the lower price. It helps us gain valuable insight, which in turn will help get Scotland towards net zero. Customers can continue to enjoy that gas supply that gives them instant warmth, control of their heating and customer choice. And it helps the environment and protects future generations by moving to a clean energy source. The last thing on this that I want to say is that customers have the option to opt out at any point. So they can register for the trial and unregister the next day. They can register for the trial, get all the way to installation and cancel on the day of installation. They can get to two days before the trial ends or they can follow right through to the end of the trial and still choose that they want to go back to natural gas, at which point we will revert everything again free of charge to them. So at no point are they stuck on a system that they don't want to. And that really just goes back to that customer acceptance. It's about understanding how the public feel. So the customer journey, before engaging um, with potential customers, it was really important to engage with representatives and local stakeholders. We're going to come over to this side of the room. That's OK. So light's not my. Um, I can't stress enough how, how what a massive part to play our stakeholder and community teams have played in this prior to me even joining the business. Before we spoke to any customers, we engaged with all of the movers and shakers in the local area. So your housing associations, your local authority, community groups, Anybody who was anybody in the area we spoke to and we, we wanted them to understand what it was that we were bringing. Part of what was recommended to us was the community liaison group. They're great. So this is comprised of key stakeholders. Like I say, we've got charities in there, we've got schools, we've got businesses, um, we've got really a, a representative from every corner of it. And I think we've now got 20 plus registered members of it. They are our sounding board, they are our litmus test, and they give us advice on everything. So everything from how do we communicate with customers? How do we tell them that we're starting this? Right through to now, we, we run everything past them and they are so, so important for us. It's massive and, and probably quite underrated in, in a lot of projects that if anyone from any area goes to their MP, goes to somebody that they trust in the local in, in their community and like I said that could be a charity it could be a local enterprise and that key person in the community doesn't know about it you're on the back foot straight away because they can't advocate for you they can't tell you or, or reassure that customer that yes yeah, it's, it's legit you need to we, we found that working with these people has been just so crucial for us and everything that we've, that we've done so they give us insight into local events, activities and challenges. We did loads of local research and, and what that told us was that they didn't want us to come in 
invest loads of money in things and then if we ever go it goes with us and the, the community are left in a worse position than they were when we came so we've made it our commitment that we will support a community groups and, and we'll basically just advance what's already there and we do that through really simple things so sponsorship of the, the community groups like clear um, or brag we work with east fife community football club to deliver probably skipping ahead of my own slides here but that's all right don't tell anyone um, we, we work with East Fife Community Football Group. So what they'll do during summer holidays, during service days, is run pay what you can camps. So kids in the local area have somewhere to go, spend their time, they get lunch at it. Nine till three every day, it's sorted. They have things to do. And that's things that are already running. They will be there if we're ever not. But it means we can really help in the community while we, while we are. So we work closely with local authority and housing associations, like I say making sure that we use their st strands of customer engagement again just to get out to that wider teams and wider voice and we work with local schools so in partnership with bright green hydrogen we've delivered a hygiene education program to 10 schools in the local area with plans to extend that further and we work with leave and mouth academy as well and that's down to even things like when we're doing leafleting when we're doing flyers we can bring the kids along we'll work with youth task forces in the local area to really get a sense of where are the kids? What do they want to see? What are the young people interested in? And are we doing the right things for them? And um, it allows them to get a bit of experience in the, the real world, if you like. So customer registrations, again, we won't read through all of this, but by aligning the research and the advice from our panel of experts, we designed an engagement plan that appeals to our customers and ensures they feel supported and informed throughout. So a quick rundown down the side there, March to September 2002, we started with informational postcards. Our idea was to do a glossy brochure, put it through everyone's door. And we were told by our community liaison group, absolutely not. You have 10 seconds from them picking that up off the doormat, walking to the bin and flinging it in the bin. That's how quickly you have to engage them. So what we did was redesigned all of that and made four postcards that get kind of put out at various stages throughout the trial as we worked towards things and then invited them to our first open events and our Leaving Mouth Fair Day, which we held for the first time last year. So launch day was October 2022. And at that point, we really started to partner with door-to-door -door, uh, door -door information. So again, going door-to-door -door has been massively beneficial for us. And that was what our community liaison group told us that people wanted. We can have a cup of tea with them if that's what they want. We can arrange to come back. Vitally, even for people who don't want to participate in the trial, we can talk to them. We can tell them what's happening in their street. We can tell them about the, the programme, where it's up to, what information do they want, do they need, and then we can get it to them. So it's not that this is a very inclusive project, not an exclusive one. Community engagement from November, we surpassed the minimum requirement for registrations. So like I say, we're looking for 300 homes. We have over 300 homes now subscribed to the trial um, and a waiting survey. And yeah, up till now, it's very much about continuing that door-to-door -door engagement, making sure people know where we are, who we are, um, and what we stand for in the local area, how we can help them, local sponsorships and community and partnership work. And that will progress from now until the end of the trial. So I want to finish on this slide, and we talk a lot about being a brand for good, and I think it's summed up earlier in the quote about we think about our customers and everything that we do. So like I said earlier, this isn't a trial for 300 homes. This is a trial for the whole Leaving Mouth area. It's a project that can benefit the whole area massively from those 300 houses. So to continue to improve the customer sentiment, we've made a couple of commitments there. So sustain and improve the early relationships that we built with the community. We'll engage that through local events and we will maintain a presence through the entire project. That is our commitment. An openness, a culture of openness and transparency. So I, I was speaking to someone earlier um, at the tea break and I talk about trading short term discomfort for long term dysfunction. And I think that's true in every area of our lives. We never want to have difficult conversations, but if we are not open and honest, we lose all that trust that we built. And it's important for us to be an honest broker in the local area. We keep things simple. So um, much like Arlen had said during his presentation, we communicate at the right level, we communicate in the right way and at the right times for the people that we're speaking to. So I am not an engineer. So quite often when my team are talking to me, I'm like, no idea. 
and it's important that when we speak to customers as exciting the technology as exciting it's a really great step that we're taking but we have to make that information available to them in a way that they understand in a way that i understand so we listen to understand we will continue to listen to our customers and the wider community to ensure that we constantly improve what we are doing because what was right in march 2020 might not be right now and we have to know that so that we can continue to serve them in a positive and engaging way and make sure they have everything that they need from us. So that is the end of me. I'll happily take any questions. Um, otherwise, thank you. That's great, really different uh, approach to how to do things properly. So that's terrific. Uh, thank you. Anyway, uh, questions from in the room or commentary? Yep, one question here. Can you say who you are as well before you uh, ask the question, please? Yeah, Zai Jangda from Harriet Ward University. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was really good to see, and I wish uh, you success in your project. Yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, obviously, this is a trial, and you're saying that uh, it has been hard to convince uh, people to opt in, and the cost has been the main factor, and providing them the benefits uh, has uh, led them to sign in. So, once you expand the project to thousand and five thousand or ten thousand so would you still be providing all these benefits to people who sign up or just try to see other factors uh, that would uh, yeah so h100 is a project to prove customer acceptance it will run until march 2027 at that point h100 will no longer be a project so what we're doing is feeding the government the information they need to make the heat policy decision and beyond that like I say, it's, it's then really in the, the suppliers and, and, and the governments and to make those decisions about what support there is out there. Grant, you can say who you are, please. Thank you. Uh, Grant Wilson, University of Birmingham. Interested to hear, um, this looks like a very successful project. Whitby, on the other hand, is um, having some challenges i believe um from from your perspective or what do you see as the main differences potentially i am obviously not here to talk about any other trial and i, I truthfully don't know um what the early engagement looks like okay. what i can say that we've done and and i would advocate for anybody to do in any trial is engage early be open be honest have the conversations with the, the movers and shakers in the area um so that they understand what's going on Okay. That's how we've grown that success. That's that's absolutely the motto that I would go with. Okay, thank you. But I just ask then, roughly how many people on from SGN are involved in the whole program of engaging with H100? So we've we've got a core team of myself and three others that are engaging on the ground. So myself, my my colleague Margaret, eh, and my colleague Elle are really the feet on the ground. But I can't really can't say highly enough how amazing it's been the support from around the business from our comms teams from their stakeholder groups this isn't a, a three-man band or a one-person effort this is this is a whole department a whole company that that believes in the future and wants to do the right thing by the customer thank you very much one right at the back corner on the Okay, I, I have one question. Uh, uh, you give an excellent talk. My question is, you, you said, I think by 2013 or 2027, I, I don't remember yet, and 25% of the family will uh, disconnect with the use of the fossil fuel, natural gas uh, in the home. And if disconnect with this kind of fossil fuel, is switch to electricity or switch to hydrogen. If switch to the hydrogen, what kind of hydrogen supply is from the tank or from the pipe? So is it, do so, you have any idea? So I think that statistic that you're talking about is when I was talking about what the, the area that we're working in and how ultimately financially deprived that area is. 
So what the, the, the point of that statistic, I suppose, was around 25% of people felt that they couldn't afford to heat their whole home with their central heating system and were therefore choosing to heat individual rooms with electric heaters. Just to clarify. That's great. I think I'm going to all right, take Ian if it's quick. Say, uh, say who. So uh, Ian Molnar, University of Edinburgh. So have you, I guess, following up on, on Graham's question a little, have you dug into a little bit of what's caused some people to, to have a positive versus negative sentiment? Like, you know, looked at like the demographics of, of the happies yeah. versus the sads or? <laughs> yeah, so obviously the, the whole trial, we're in the very, very early stages of the trial, so we haven't installed anything yet. So I suppose we're we're in the very early stages of gathering the information to see what makes customers feel good or bad about it. But yes, that is all information that we gather. We know that price is, is really up there and the uncertainty of what happens towards the end. Okay, off the hook. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Survived very well. That's... Uh, now we're going to move to a, a piece of work which was done as part of the uh, High Store Poor project with Leslie Mabon, who started off, I don't know, I can't remember, started off at the Scottish Marine Institute, maybe, I can't remember, then eventually moved to uh, a different part of a different institution, now works for the Open University, very confusing. <laughs> and anyway, Leslie's uh, going to talk about his work on surveying stakeholders about the storage of hydrogen and its place in the energy system in Scotland. Over to you, half an hour. All right, great. Um, can everybody hear me at the back? Excellent. I'll keep projecting in that case. Uh, so thanks very much. Morning, everybody. Um, my name's Leslie Naven from the Open University. I'm going to talk a little bit now, building on a couple of the, the presentations that we've had before about some particularly stakeholder perspectives on hydrogen in especially its storage in the UK's kind of decarbonisation landscape. When I say stakeholders, what I mean, well, a whole range of people, basically, you know, people from politics, from industry, uh, civil society, non-governmental organisations. Why is this important? This is important because these tend to be the people that shape how the public and how energy users think about uh, different technologies. And these are people who are have a really important role in shaping opinions. So we're going to talk a bit about some of the work that we've done in High Storeport to understand, you know, how these opinion shapers think about hydrogen and its storage in the, the UK system. Before I start, I want to just say a big thank you to a lot of my, my former colleagues at the, the Scottish Association for Marine Science, who um, really did a, a power of work in a very short space of time to, to drive a lot of this forward. Um, Julie Rostan and Susie Billing, and also George Charles and Bidas, and also Iona and Adam. Um, so a, this is what I'm, I'm showing you now is not just my work. There was a, a big team behind uh, getting all of this, uh, getting all of this together, and delivering it uh, during uh, during COVID and the, the the time that followed. I should say as well, uh, this is not Scotland. Clearly, uh, it's clearly not Scotland. This is a Toyota Mirai, which is a pretty class thing. Um, this is a fuel cell vehicle. And through the presentation, I've kind of peppered in a few pictures from uh, from, from Japan, we would have a personal connection to, mainly because it's one of the places in the world where you can actually see quite a lot of hydrogen in daily life. And Kita Kyushu is in, in, in the south of Japan, and it's managed to transform itself from being a Japanese kind of capital of pollution and Yakuza shootings into a center of um, of hydrogen and you know the, you see a lot of kind of houses and things that are are, are powered by by hydrogen and so you know it, it was interesting so i've just peppered in a few pictures here of hydrogen in daily life because that's what we're we're talking about and that's what in this part of the, the research we've been trying to think about you know how does hydrogen fit into people's daily lives and who is it that informs how the public at large thinks about hydrogen in in their daily life so what have we done? Well, we, we've had to kind of bend and shape and change what we've done because of COVID and the various challenges that presented for getting people in rooms to talk to each other. So we've done a whole sort of things over the, the, the last couple of years. And some of you, many of you in this room might actually have participated in some of this stuff for, for which we're, uh, we're very grateful. Um, so we, we, we did some reviews and synthesis of existing work that's been done on, on hydrogen and on storing things in the subsurface. We did a bunch of interviews with stakeholders. We've run some some workshops, some expert workshops 
over the course of last year, looking at different perspectives on hydrogen in the UK's uh, net zero energy system, and also looked at, uh, at what's been said on, 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 on social media. Again, because a lot of this is, is what drives how people come to understand new and, and potentially challenging uh, technologies like hydrogen. So I really want to focus on are the stakeholder workshops because these are the things where we got the richest, the richest insights. These are the kind of the, that was the main thing that we wanted to do, and that's the thing that we we kind of got out of it. But first, I also wanted just to highlight um, some of the, the findings from the social media analysis because I think there's a few useful and interesting things in here. And I'm also going to at this point to uh, provide a bit of an apology. Some of you might have seen this stuff already. You know, some of you might, use, might have seen this twice because we're at the stage of the project where we're starting to summarize things and pull things together. And, but I'll, I'll hopefully what, what I present kind of builds on what you might have seen before and then gives us a few new, new insights. So um, another thing I should add as well is that all these slides were prepared at the start of this week. You know, I prepared all these slides at the start of this week and I was getting chasing emails, getting their slides and da 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 da, fired everything together, pulled everything together, sent it across and then bang, I opened Twitter yesterday morning to find that the Whitby demonstration had been pulled. And I was thinking, right, oh no. Um, I didn't actually say oh no, but you know, you, you can get the, the sense. Because, you know, I thought that actually tells us something quite interesting about that. There was a lot of debate and discourse on social media about hydrogen that arose because of that. And on one hand, you know, I think we've got to remember social media platforms are not the real world. And, you know, uh, and one thing I'll come back to in a minute is that a kind of small and noisy majority, minority of people can actually kick up a lot of noise and, and pull people in a certain direction. Nonetheless, you know, they do influence how society at large thinks about issues, and particularly controversies, big news items can become focusing events that can give us an insight into how society thinks about particular issues. But be being one of those, but um, I'm not going to talk about that now, but this, this is work that we did a bit earlier in a project about, you know, who's talking about hydrogen in the online space and what they're saying. So um, this was about Twitter. At the time we did the work, this was before your man had taken over the platform, and it actually you, know, you could get a pretty good access to data. You could actually figure out what was going on. So I'd like to hope that what we're seeing is still relevant to social media in general, even if the specific ways in which uh, Twitter is used um, may be now a bit less useful due to the ways in which the, the chat with the rockets and electric cars has uh, changed the platform. But, you know, we, we looked at, at a whole bunch of tweets and we looked at who was saying what and, you know, what kind of tone, what kind of messaging people were putting out. And I think there's a, a few useful insights there. One being that, you know, the kind of tone, the attitude towards hydrogen varies a lot depending on the sector of who is, is putting the message out. So we found that people from government, industry and, and actually research and science were overwhelmingly positive about hydrogen. Individuals were a lot more negative. We also found that attitudes were generally different depending on the kind of use of hydrogen that was being proposed. So industrial applications, kind of combinations of renewables, tended to be viewed a lot more favorably. Thinking about hydrogen in context of heat and also in context of the overall energy system tended to be picked up in a lot of a lot more negatively. And a lot of the negative argumentation when you drill down into what exactly people were saying was about safety, environmental impacts, and also association with the, the, the fossil fuel industry. So I'm, I'm not going to go into the too much detail on these, just to show that we talked, we looked a little bit at what was being said around COP26. We looked a little bit at what was being said around some uh, an article that came out in the New York Times that uh, took a, a, um, a rather contentious study about hydrogen. And you find that different events have different people talking about them. So for COP, we found there was a lot more engagement from government industry actors, particularly a lot of kind of positive arguments around actually getting stuff done. When we looked at the story that was in the New York Times, it was that looked at some study that had kind of said hydrogen was actually going to emit more and more CO2 or whatever, or more methane than, uh, than it was going to um, reduce. We found a lot of the more people that engaged with that were members of the public. And again, a lot of the negative sentiment there came from environmental impacts and safety and also associations with, with the extractive industry. So again, a lot of that I think has to do with who it is that's putting the message out, who's telling the story, what's being picked up. 
just a couple of word clouds there of what we found. But why does that matter? Why is that important in terms of storage? Well, across everything that we looked at, there was virtually nothing in there on storage of hydrogen, whether geological or otherwise. You know, so when we think about high store power, when you think about geological storage and where this hydrogen is being stored, there's a need there potentially for industry and governments to actually communicate more about how this hydrogen is, is being stored. Also as well about illustrating how geological storage is going to enable hydrogen applications across the, the whole system. And lastly, and again, this is something that we've seen with the discourse and debates about, about, the, about, about Whitby that came out in a couple of days. Unfortunately, the public and sadly, increasingly, our media tend to engage a lot more with controversy and with highly polarised debates than with uh, nuanced and balanced positions, even if these kind of middle ground yes and no positions tend to be underpinned by better science. So, you know, that, that's a challenge and, that, and that's something I would I kind of leave as an open challenge. How do researchers, industry and governments, how can you react to controversy? How can you kind of get some of these more nuanced and balanced messages out in an environment that often favours extreme polarised positions you know, and, and very angry debates? But as I say that, I just wanted to kind of give a bit of a, a, a highlight there. What I want to talk about a lot more is about um, stakeholder workshops that we ran and about how hydrogen fits into the, the, the net zero mix across the, the UK. And then I'm going to do what Ailey did and I'm going to come across here, partly because I'm going to go into cramp. If I don't, I hope that the camera can still pick me up and that I'm not uh, blocking the team screen. So we, did, we, we, we pulled a couple of little graphics together just to think about, well, how does hydrogen fit into the, the net zero mix? What are some of the other things that might be going on at the same time? And the reason we pulled these together as a, a little stimulus for our participants was that, you know, very quickly we, we became aware that it was quite hard, even for people who were quite informed about hydrogen, to talk about it in isolation and to talk about it in, in separation from the, the, um, the different uh, technologies and the different things that might get us to, to net zero. So for the next five, ten minutes or so, I'm just going to take you through some of the, the kind of overarching themes, some of the big ideas that came out of these workshops and came out of the discussions when we transcribed everything and looked at everything and put all that text together and, and, and saw what we had. And so the first is, well, this question of, well, what is actually the role? The different stakeholders we talked to, what do they see as being the role of hydrogen in and its storage in, in, in the mix, in the net zero mix? Again, it kind of reflects what we'd seen in the, in the in the social media data. We generally saw a preference for hydrogen for industry and for transport rather than for, for, for domestic, and a perception that the readiness was closer for, for industry than for than for aviation, and that it was even further away for, for, for home usage. And the concern there came a lot about cost compared to electrification, especially for some of the, the investment and, and scaling up. And again, worth just highlighting. Within that, unless you had people that had really specific geological knowledge or very in-depth technical knowledge, understanding of storage, you know, how you might store hydrogen, why you might need to store it, where you might do it, that was virtually absent from the discussion. And even when we really sort of probed and pushed people, it was quite hard to get even quite informed people about energy systems to talk about how you, you store hydrogen. So I just pulled out a couple of quotes from these 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 groups just to show you the kind of things that, that people were saying. And part of it there, interestingly, somebody up the top there had said, you know, they, they acknowledge and appreciate hydrogen has a role, you know, as a niche in actually getting us to 1.5. That you know, we like we said earlier, you know, you can't necessarily electrify everything. It's got a role in there. Somebody else in the yellow box was talking a bit about clusters. Somebody here was talking about, well, you know, how fast the landscape was changing and their increased apprehension about hydrogen for uh, for domestic heat. So, you know, this, this idea, there were different views on where hydrogen sat in the overall picture. And a lot of that preference among the people, you know, the people from government, from research, from, from industry who are going to be talking with the public, it, they saw the, the, the main value being in the industrial applications. We also thought that, and again, this is this, we've seen this in some of the previous talks as well, that things happen over time. So you know, the world is not static, society is not static, things change. And you know, as we talk to people, the idea of what happens and when came across quite a lot as well. 
And again, you know, this idea that you know it's not an either or, it's not electrification or hydrogen. You know, a lot of people we talk with, you know, acknowledge that and understood that quite well, that there's a role and a place for both, and that you're gonna need different things at different times to keep us under 1.5 degrees. You know, and there's, there's this, this emphasis on readiness, you know, what hydrogen applications are ready now, what's gonna be ready in 10 years, you know, what is it that we should be prioritizing, you know, what, what is and what's gonna be needed and, and, and when. And I think we did, we did see coming up quite a lot, and it's maybe a false false dichotomy, but it is nonetheless something that was mentioned to us a lot, is this reduced hope and expectation for hydrogen due to perception that other things like wind and solar already work and are already being deployed. Whether that's grounded in technical and scientific reality or not, it's a different matter, but you know, even again, even quite informed stakeholders, they see big offshore wind farms, they see solar fields, they see stuff happening in quite a visible and tangible way. You know, and that drives people's sort of apprehensions. Okay, well, you know, what is the role for hydrogen? What is that role going to be? When is it going to happen? Again, just to to pull out a few of the um, a few of the quotes that sort of give some some colour to that. And, you know, somebody up there in the yellow at the top saying, "Look, okay, industry is great. We know how to do that. Doing that for domestic heating, even if we want to, is a different beast. It's going to take a a lot more time, and it can't be done abruptly. You know, and again, there's a there's there's concerns about the realities, about the timescales, the feasibility, about how long it takes to actually do some of this stuff in, in practice compared to the timeframes over which we need to see responses. So there's also, again, a lot about synergies and trade-offs. And, you know, and that becomes important, I think, when we think about things like a just transition. So we think about, well, how do we decarbonize places, industries that are really important for people's livelihoods. And this came up as well. So I've said hydrogen for gas, that's a typo. It should be hydrogen for heat. Again, what we kept getting coming back to us was this is a bad idea um, due to changes to appliances and insurance and all the rest. Industrial clusters, and well, that came up as well. You know, the, the, the scene as being useful messaging. Can you build hydrogen into helping to decarbonize clusters, groups of industry? Can you look for synergies with carbon capture? Can you do all of these things in a way that's going to help to decarbonize regions, places that have got a lot of high emitting industry that provide a lot of jobs at the moment? Can you help to, to use these things in a, in a connected way to actually do that decarbonization in a way that protects jobs and, uh, and protects local economies? So again, these are, you know, these are kind of quite extensive quotes. Now, I don't want to uh, go into depth, but just picking out some of the things that, that, that come out there, you know, that you do have people who knew a bit more about oil and gas who'd said, well, we've got some of that know-how already. There are things that we, we know how to do and we need to get the messaging out there that we, we know how to do this stuff. You know, we've got some of the infrastructure already. Others, you know, a lot more skeptical about the feasibility and viability of that. So again, we saw a, a breadth of, of positions in there. Perhaps the kind of last piece in there, the, the, the sort of last bit of that is, as I say, you know, hydrogen doesn't happen on its own. Hydrogen as a, as a, a, as a, a part of, of, of net zero doesn't happen in isolation from people. And, you know, just like we saw in, in Ailey's talk, you know, the world has changed from 2020. You know, it's different. You know, things are different now. Things will be different, you know, and, and people's behaviours, people's practices are, are changing as well. And, you know, this is something we got told quite a lot as well, that, you know, that it's not just about changing technologies, but there are also potentially changes in people's behaviours that are going to be needed. There are changes that are going to happen as a kind of matter of course, as we go through the, the decarbonisation journey. And so there's this demand side and behavioural aspect, which is, is, is as important as the, the, the supply side and how you fit hydrogen and its storage into a world where we have people who are also consuming less as a as a priority but also noting too that even among the public as a big group so the public we sometimes still in the social sciences tend to think of the public as this big kind of blob whereas actually you know you've got a lot of difference in there you've got people who've got very different levels of knowledge different levels of education you know, different kind of levels of awareness understanding and indeed different levels of willingness to engage with uh, with different perspectives. So, you know, the different types of people will have different types of understanding about how they might see hydrogen as fitting into their, their, their lives. 
And this this question came up, and I mentioned it a little bit before about is this creating jobs? Is this creating skills? It's something I would love to look at in more depth. It's out out of the scope for what we wanted to do for high store poor, but it's 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 important again. You know, if you actually want to build hydrogen into our daily lives, doesn't matter if that's industry, transportation, heating, you need people who can do that. You know, you need technicians, you need people who are skilled. We got asked this a lot, you know, what are the, what's the jobs opportunity going to be? Where are these jobs going to be located? How are you going to train people up? Can you make sure that these are good, high value local jobs and not just things that are being outsourced to other parts of the world? And particularly when we talked to people who, who worked a lot with, uh, with wind in Scotland, that was one of the big frustrations that's been seen with offshore wind, with a lot of the manufacturing and things, is that a lot of that work isn't always seen as coming to local communities, especially in more rural places like where I live. So that came up a lot as well. How do you do this in a way where you, um, you, create, uh, you create jobs? So, you know, part of that is, you know, as I said, we've got some, some quotes here just to illustrate um, this, this thing about behavior change and how important the behavior change piece is. I'm thinking about how hydrogen fits with this, this, this idea of a changing society, changing values, changing practices, but also, you know, the, the imperative that if we are giving messaging about jobs and skills, that that's realistic, that that's grounded in evidence, and that we're not overstating the potential for, for hydrogen to help and support uh, some of these, these transitions to happen. So um, I've got half an hour. Um, I said I usually try and talk for about 20 minutes to leave a bit of time for Q&A. So I'm going to kind of finish there, but I want to leave you with three sort of key messages from the, the work that we did. And the first kind of goes back to the start. You know, I said, well, you know, what do the kind of stakeholders who are going to shape public opinion, what do they, what do they think about, about hydrogen? And I think the first thing to say is there is support for hydrogen in the net zero energy mix. You know, you might not think that if you go and look at some of the loudest voices on social media, but across the kind of energy space and the, you know, the, the expertise and those who shape public opinion, there is a good understanding and a good recognition that hydrogen has got a really important role in getting us to, to 1.5 degrees. But the rationale for where and when and why it's being used needs to be clearly articulated. And that, you know, that, that then has to kind of come across to the, the public as well. And as I was just saying, you know, there's just questions about the time frame. So when are we doing hydrogen? When are we doing different applications? When are we doing different types of things? Why are we doing them? And how does that relate not just to the kind of energy systems that we have, but also how does that relate to the kind of society we have? What kind of society are we going to have in five, 10 years? How is hydrogen going to, going to fit into that? And then the last point as well, it's one that's worth coming back to, given that this is... Um, high store for, and there's the store bit in the middle there, it is really challenging to still have these discussions about uh, about storage, you know, and, and let alone geological storage, any kind of storage. When we started this work, you know, way back when, you know, we were kind of thinking, oh, the thing everybody's going to be really concerned about is about safety and then storage and, and, and you know, the, the kind of imagery that that can, can come up. But what we found to an extent was almost the reverse. It was actually quite difficult in any sort of way to, to have any kind of discussions about storage, let alone geological storage. But putting it in that, that bigger picture in that context of how hydrogen fits into the, the, the energy system and society is, is critical. So I'm simply going to stop there. I think that leaves a bit of time. So I'm very happy to take any questions you have. And um, thanks for your attention. And also thank you to Stuart for putting the public perception session before lunch. Many of you who know me from CCS days will be used to me doing presentations super fast while everybody's sprinting for their train. So uh, thank you very much, Stuart, and thank you all of you. Great, Leslie, thank you very much indeed, uh, especially for finishing a bit earlier. Question at the back then. We've got time for a couple of questions and the next presentation we're going to go online for, in fact. Can you say who you are again, please? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tarek Rashwan, also from the Open University, colleague of Leslie's. Leslie, thank you very much for this. It's uh, I'm always fascinated by your research, and I, I'm interested in the social media analysis. And so, uh, 
I can imagine social media influencing like domestic use of hydrogen strongly. Um, thinking about oh, I you know not in my backyard kind of hydrogen lines going to their houses. But I'm wondering about how you think social media influences industrial use. I, I can imagine a lot of that happens maybe behind closed doors. Maybe it's not something that public would interface with as much. Maybe I'm off base, but yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Tarek. That's a great question. I, I assure you all as well that question was not a plant. That was in, despite Tarek and I both come in from the OU. It's it's a it's a good question. I think you're right. I think when you talk about industrial applications, a lot of that stuff tends to happen um, in places where there is maybe already existing industrial activity. And again, kind of just going off base a bit and talking about some of our experience with carbon capture. Tends to be with residents who are nearby. It's just another bit of kit in an industrial site. It's just another thing happening in a site that's maybe kind of something they're already familiar with, and that you know that, that's maybe something that an, an operator who's already a good and trusted employer is doing. So I think in that sense, at a local level, it doesn't necessarily have much of an impact. Where I think for industrial applications, some of the social media stuff is is um, is significant is when we think at a kind of national level. And particularly when we see operations that are being done by the private sector that may be getting public funding or maybe fitting in with government energy strategies where it may be perceived as hydrogen being used to prolong a fossil fuel industry in an area, where it may be perceived as the private sector getting public funds to do something that where the 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 compatibility with 1.5 degrees isn't always readily apparent. Obviously, I'm not saying that's the reality. I'm just saying that sometimes can be the perception. How that then influences what happens is when politicians see stuff like that, when they see that discourse, that way of talking, that can then be seen as how the electorate might vote. That can sway how people think about how things are reported in the press and how voters might vote. So at the local level, I don't see that kind of discourse as influencing what goes on. At the national level, I think it feeds into the picture of, you know, in whose interest different applications are happening. Thanks. OK, yep. Uh, Danny Friedrich, University of Edinburgh. Uh, thank you, Leslie, for the interesting talk. And it's good to see that hydrogen for heating is slowly getting pushed out. Last month, the CCC said uh, uh, hydrogen should at most be a small and focused role. Has this changed for the industrial players as well, the, the role of hydrogen plays in the energy system in the future, shifting away from heat to others over the course of your project? It's a good question. I think based on, on the work we've done, I would say we have seen that shift away as well. We probably haven't done enough kind of longitudinally to see a kind of real shift in what people are saying. But I think, you know, if, if you just look, if I look back at some of the kind of transcripts and discussion that we had even before COVID, we saw people talking a lot more about quite grand visions for how you might have hydrogen in, in home heating. You can even see that that rhetoric is now shifting towards niche applications, towards hard to decarbonize sectors, towards you know, doing that last 20% that we need to keep ourselves below 1.5. So I would say, yeah, it, it has. And I would say, in a sense, it, again, it mirrors my experience with carbon capture. I think as you start to get early demonstrations happening, as people start to learn from, from what's going on, and as, as different technologies in the landscape evolve, you start to see a certain technology maybe finding its place. And that's maybe what, what we're seeing with hydrogen. So I would say we maybe don't have the longitudinal data to say that's the case for certain, intuitively from what we've seen and what we've heard, yet you are seeing that kind of slow, gradual shift. OK, that's good. Thanks very much. Whether it's good or bad, I guess, it depends on who you are in the audience. But, so. Thanks very much, Leslie. I'm going to stop there and try and catch up a little bit of time, move on to the next talk. But again, Leslie, you're presumably not getting a train for a few hours yet. Nope, I'm around for, for lunch and, and part of the afternoon as well. So very, very happy to chat over lunch and coffee. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks to the wonders of electricity. Now, uh, then we're going to go online for the next presentation from Joel, uh, Joel Gordon from Cranfield University, who's also going to talk about public perception of risk and benefit uh, from using a different technique from multi-group analysis. So. Joel, hopefully you're online and available.
Joel, you have a uh, microphone and video access, so you should be able to uh, switch on your camera. OK, wonderful. Yes, yeah, I'm in. Uh, can you hear me fine? Yes. Wonderful. OK, so I understand we're trying to wrap up before lunch, so I head straight in. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the invitation to join today. As you hear, my name's Joel, and I'm at Cranfield University, and I'm a couple months from wrapping up the PhD project, which is specifically on the topic that's now pretty much in the media and kind of more controversial than it was when I started around hydrogen for homes. Um, I, I do want to flag very much at the outset that the way we've approached our modeling and other aspects of the research is that these findings are pretty strongly transferable. So at one point we were factoring up, should we compare directly to heat pumps, for example, in our survey? And at the other side, um, we tried to look at blue and green hydrogen, as you'll see today, and also the perceptions of the UK's um, hydrogen strategy. So even though our focus is on the homes or the domestic side, it's quite a, a broad um, you know, approach, if you will. Um, that's great. So we can go to the first slide and there we go. So it's just a very quick or brief overview. As I said, I'll be looking at acceptance in the domestic context. Um, I'll give a brief overview of the research design and then also include one slide on my kind of conceptual framework, which underpins, you know, the modeling and um, most of our results. And we'll have a look at descriptive outputs from the study and then the actual model itself and the visualizations. And I've included kind of a little focus on safety perceptions given today's um, uh, topic. So next slide, please. That's great. So this is just one slide. There's a bonus at the end for anyone who wants to see a bit more breakdown. So we ran this online survey between October and December last year, and we ended up with a final sample size of 1,845 responses. And this was actually developed off previous work, which took place between February and April of 2022, which was about 10 online focus groups. And a couple of those studies are just coming out as we speak. So. Again, for further interest, one of them's on blue and green uh, hydrogen uh, production or perceptions, so it's a pretty interesting one. And we set up things very deliberately here, based on that previous work, that we targeted subgroups. So we had a very technology and environmentally engaged group, and then one notch down, we had a moderately technology and environmentally engaged group, so we could get that comparison in. And we had a fuel stress group, which didn't have you know, or less than moderate levels of engagement in technology and environment. And then finally, we controlled for all of this with a baseline group, which just had none of those previous categories or um, parameters all excluded. And the baseline group was actually the biggest one. It's just short of 700 responses because we deliberately wanted to have more data on kind of the generic um, consumer, if you will. Um, and that gives us the overall breakdown we see in this slide. Uh, there's one other thing I'd like to mention before we move on. This survey is pretty much broadly nationally representative. We couldn't quite get everything we wanted, but we did achieve uh, nationally represent or national representativeness in terms of location, also in terms of gender. And then with age, it was quite close. We had actually slight over-representation of older participants, I think it was. Um, and then there's a couple of very critical filters that should be kept in mind before we go into the results. Basically, all respondents were users of gas heating and gas cooking deliberately on our side, um, you know, trying to there target people that are going to be most directly influenced or impacted potentially by this transition if it does go forward in certain parts of the country. And also they had to have at least moderate levels of um, involvement in financial decision making about the purchase of boilers and hobs. And they also had to attribute an at least moderate level of importance to actually choosing these technologies. So again, trying to zoom in on uh, engagement on that aspect. And then finally, we only had, um, let's say, property owners outright or mortgage owners. So we didn't include the rental sector in this particular survey. However, we did have those groups in our um, you know, earlier work on the focus groups. Um, that's great. So we can go to the next slide. Perfect. So I think this one is animated. So you can click through an animation. Sorry, yeah, I think this was the previous one I sent in. Uh, there's one more if you if you go. 
wonderful. I'll just keep an eye on the animation. So um, this, this is showing actually, um, let's say, a full version of the model. And today, I'll just present on those three ones you see with the ticks by them, which kind of covers our focus there on uh, benefits and costs and risks. So I think in terms of production perceptions, we have blue and green hydrogen going off the twin track approach. And this, again, we use as a proxy for environmental attitude, if you will. And then at the level of risk perception, which is particularly interesting for today's context, we have safety, which I consider in my work more of a hard risk. It has those kind of potential long-term implications. And then we also have at the same time, the short-term disruptive impacts of the hydrogen switchover, which we heard about a couple of talks back in, in the Fife uh, context, for example. These are kind of softer risks, um, maybe easier to mitigate in theory, hopefully. And then finally, at the level of costs and benefits, we look specifically at perceived costs in the broader socioeconomic sense. And then we juxtapose this to community benefits, which of course has been very much of the for at the forefront of today's discussion already. And um, I'll go through each of these in the next slide and we'll get a sense of how these were actually measured in our survey. So next one's good to go, thanks. Uh, it's also animated, so I think it's just one click or two, maximum one, one, sorry, yeah. So um, firstly, in terms of safety, uh, well, let's say in terms of safety and production perceptions and also community benefits, just to clarify, as you see here, actually, the slide we have is this 11 point scale. Um, again, we have this kind of, you know, wide gap because none of these measures really got much beyond seven, but we want to show the full scale so there's not any, um, you know, misinterpretation. And we'll just go quickly or briefly in sequence here. So we evaluated blue hydrogen production and green hydrogen production in both the short and long term. And we defined short term, as you see, up until the end of this decade. And then we have this overall me measure, uh, number five on, on our one here, of the twin track approach. And you see that actually drops off a little bit from a couple of the others, and I'll cover this more uh, lately. Uh, sorry, later rather. Um, now, it's not maybe the focal point of today's presentation, but if you look closely, there's actually one interesting finding already emerging here, and it's kind of an inverse phenomenon around the twin track strategy, if you will. So whether this is being implicate, uh, implemented rather in the UK or it goes somewhere else like Germany, we hear this discussed as being you know, the blue side being an enabler of green hydrogen or a stepping stone. But actually, our respondents in the survey, they seem to go with this more immediate focus on having green hydrogen ramped up earlier on, now, if you will, and then having this kind of more openness to blue hydrogen in the long term. So it's quite an interesting dynamic that we've picked up and we try to explore more in the research. And then briefly on the safety perceptions, which I'll cover later on, um, we can just flag one or two kind of crystal clear observations. We don't really see much difference going on in these in these measures. So what does it boil down to is people are seeing the hydrogen home appliances or the pipelines or underground storage, which we just heard about a lot from Leslie, quite similarly. They're not showing much difference. And then this is reflected in the overall measure of safety at the end there, SP5. And then when we move on to community benefits, we do start to see some differences emerge. So the environmental benefits are getting uh, the most weight, if you will. And then if we move back across this slide, we see that kind of coupling to green hydrogen production in the short term. So that's one of the dynamics already shining through here. And the socioeconomic side of you know, economic social benefits, they're a little bit off, if you will. So you'll see this again visualized a bit later, but it's nice to flag it early on. So we can go to the next slide. That's great. It has one or two animations. Sorry. Yeah, one more actually in the middle. Great. Sorry about that. So um, again, this is a bit briefer because it's just those two measures I've included and they're measured on a five point scale rather. Um, disruptive impacts, people are concentrating a bit more on the prospect or the risk of being temporarily disconnected from the gas grid. That's DI2 here. And then in terms of perceived costs, it's more on the negative impacts of the transition potentially on fuel poverty rather than energy security impacts. We compared these two. And then I looked recently at the Bayes Public Attitudes Tracker from last winter, and 
they have different metrics which actually support this quite closely, which is interesting to see also. Um, so next slide is ready. Great. And then one more before we look at the model. We we want to actually compare these different subgroups. We we'd go we go across all the various measures, but at the end of the day, probably we're most interested in the outcome, the social acceptance. And when we look at the model, we don't necessarily have a way to unpack um, how the acceptance itself varies, like the outcome, because it's not the way the model runs, let's say. But on the other hand, we can see this very clearly in this kind of descriptive output. So that very engaged group, very technology and environmentally engaged, they're quite you know, distinguishable from the baseline group. And we see that, you know, with this uh, example of individual acceptance being about 7.6 compared to 5.84 in the baseline group. And we kind of see that notching, you know, between these different um, subgroups. So you go to the moderately engaged group, you think logically also they're going to be higher than the baseline group. And in fact, they are. And then we can contrast against the full sample just to get the uh, comparison a bit clearer. And there's one other interesting observation which kind of shines through. There's not much difference here between socio-political acceptance. I'm sorry, there's one more animation. If you click on, you can just uh, see that at the bottom. Socio-political acceptance is basically, do they support domestic hydrogen in the UK's energy future, which we've been touching on already, and then looking more at the community level and then individual acceptance. So these three are really pretty closely correlated. Um, we can go to the next one. That's great. Um, this one also, sorry, has one. Yeah, that's all <laughs> perfect. Um, so I won't spend too much time on this slide. And the next one is very similar, just has some different uh, numbers coming through. But I do want to obviously show the model and explain a little bit about it before we see some more kind of visually uh, engaging outputs. So this kind of condensed model, as, as you see here, the title, this is coming from partial least square structural equation modeling, uh, or PLSM, much easier for short. Uh, it's just to give kind of a broad definition, it's really a statistical technique that allows us to analyze these different relationships between observed variables, which are our measurement items in the survey. And then we have these unobserved or latent variables, which are everything you see in a circle. So again, um, you know, safety perceptions is down at the bottom in brown there we can only gauge that or get at it through having various metrics you know whether it's again the storage the transport or the home use um and this is a fully reflective model so i i won't go into too much detail but the opposite or an alternative is to have formative constructs where basically let's say it's a bit of a, a tangent but let's say um you're trying to measure performance of a, triath a triathlete or for a triathlon, if you drop um, cycling, swimming or running, you basically collapse the construct. So there can be situations where I would use that or we would use that in the model, but it doesn't um, happen to be this case. So again, we, we validate the, let's say, viability of the model through four steps that are just established in the literature and that pass. So we can go to the next one. It's just to have in the background. Um, this, yeah, that's really perfect. So the kind of um, advantage of this slide compared to the previous one is we get these statistics in brackets of the T values, which are kind of easier to gauge because as they go up, these you know, whole numbers but happen to be to three decimal places here, we start to see which constructs are having the greater weight on the outcome of social acceptance. So it's pretty clear community benefits is ranking a number one or top there, and we also have the table to um, reinforce this. And then behind community benefits, we've got the production perceptions, um, again, both positive outcomes. And then if I'm getting the sequence right, just bear with me, we have the disrupt disruptive impacts. That's right. So th this one would be, is, is negative, and we'll see this again in a couple more slides. Um, safety perceptions, it's, um, in this case, we're comparing hydrogen safety to natural gas. So this is why it's a kind of positive um, measure. And basically, you would have maybe noticed when I ran through the, the bar charts previously, people were kind of slightly more um, confident in hydrogen, but it was very marginal. They were between a five and a six on that scale of, of 10 or 11. So 
that, that's basically how we see this model carried through. And what's really important to highlight, just looking over on my, on my screen on this side, the actual kind of um, predictive capability of the model, or in sample we call it, is close to 60%, which is moderately strong for a social science study. And this is, as far as I know, kind of the first model on domestic hydrogen acceptance of this kind. There's some on, um, let's say, the acceptance for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, which helped us kind of inform and build a bit of this. When I run the kind of um, extended or full model, which had those uh, 10 constructs on an earlier slide, we boost up to closer to 70%. So this one's a bit you know, more manageable for today's purposes or illustrations, but we would see um, a jump in, in acceptance being ex explained. And there's another component to this I just mentioned briefly. We also test the out of sample predictive power of the model. So how well would this model run on other data sets you know, um, in theory? And again, we pass what is the comparisons known as like the benchmark models. We outperform that. So it's a pretty reliable model and it's performing well and it's explaining quite a good proportion of acceptance. So that's why, um, you know, if it was dropping to 40, we'd still report this and say there's a lot more to build into it and report. But it's helpful to have a model that's performing quite well, you know, for the purposes of, of the uh, publications and so on. So that's great. We can roll on to the next one. Right, so th this is actually what I really wanted to get to because showing the two models is nice, but it's not so um, visually accessible, let's say. Even for myself, I was quite new to this PLSM approach and it's not always so easy to see these various you know, constructs and the circles and the arrows. But on the other hand, this one is showing quite clearly how these dynamics of acceptance are playing out. So basically, I'll try and break this down briefly. We have on, on you know, the different axes, we have importance, which you heard about as the total effect. So in the case of um, community benefits, that was about 0.38, it was the largest. And then we have the performance, which is how well are these constructs actually measured in our survey and how well do they kind of, you know, play out overall when compared to, you know, comparatively assessed, if you will. And I tried to show this here by having you know, these two dummies of acceptance factor X and Y, which are plotted in line with community benefits. And the rationale here is acceptance factor X is performing, you know, you see it considerably better. It's around, I think, 85 where I plotted it, whereas Y is dropping down to about 35, and it's kind of just below or similar to disrupted impacts on the other side on the negative scale. And then, of course, community benefits is sandwiched somewhere in between. It's about 65. Now, what this kind of translates to, if we drill down, if we have the resources and the strategic efforts in mind for supporting hydrogen acceptance, we should actually allocate these to acceptance factor Y, because this one is still having the same or you know this large effect, but it's performing very much kind of suboptimally or poorly. And then on the other hand, acceptance factor X, there's not really so much scope for improvement. So it would not be necessarily a waste of resources, but, but it wouldn't be a good use of them to kind of target acceptance factor X, whatever that happened to be in our example. And we actually saw this pattern translate very directly when we mapped out each of these subgroups on their own kind of um, analysis of this type, this IMPA. So the, the best example is that the very engaged group, they were having a lot higher performance on community benefits. So it means that if you're running these communication campaigns or you're doing the outreach, you don't actually need to you know, translate that so much to people who are already um, technology and environmentally engaged, which makes sense to a degree. They're kind of maybe more aware of potential benefits of hydrogen, especially the environmental ones. Um, whereas by contrast, the baseline group are not having a very high performance on that metric. So we definitely want to target that alongside other things like production perceptions. Um, we can go to the next one, which is, is just the repeat, but I removed the negative scale just to give a you know, more accessible and easier summary and kind of sum this up in two or three statements. I think ultimately, and you heard this just now, the advice would be to really promote or prioritize 
better communication of community benefits, as well as the hydrogen production pathways. And this might help support social acceptance. And then on the other side, comparatively, we maybe want to look at those potential disruptive impacts rather than safety perceptions and perceived costs. And in that way, we also kind of touch on uh, negative factors because we can't just be um, full on promoting. We have to mitigate for risks and other things. You know, energy vulnerabilities during the hydrogen switchover is a big one that flagged up in our survey and potential energy injustice too and trust. So um, we can go to the next one. That's great. Um, yeah, so this has one animation. So this is the final one of this kind of my presentation, the so-called importance performance map analysis. And it's really visualizing what we saw early on. We have the environmental benefits sitting kind of out there as the most important um, factor or sub-factor. It's closely followed by those socioeconomic benefits. So it's not to say that um, we can just focus on one and forget about, as we've heard today, the jobs, the economy is critical, it's very important. And of course, these are um, highly correlated, as we heard. It's a reflective model. So there's interactions between these three. Um, if we promote environmental benefits, um, we're, we're linking it to the net zero strategy and so on and so forth. So these are all intertwined. Uh, safety is very interesting because it's just such a strong, strong cluster. It's like almost I can't um, separate them. It's, it's so extreme. It's such a strong cluster, suggesting, again, these safety perceptions are very much homogenous. And then in production perceptions, we get that variation we heard about, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more before we wrap up. Um, so that's the last one on the IMPA. It's just useful to break down those constructs to the indicator level and then zoom in a bit more. Uh, we can go to the next one. Um, perfect. So, yeah, in terms of this one, I've got at the end of the presentation as a bonus each of these submodels actually available for you know someone interested to see. How, how these uh, numbers mapped on, but really the main takeaway, and I was slightly surprised, um, you know, as doing the research and finding this, there were no actual statistically significant differences between these subgroups in terms of the constructs themselves. So people are seeing community benefits very similarly, positively, if, you know, in this case, it'd be strange if it, it wasn't positive, but they're not seeing um, much divergence or difference in the level of that assessment. And it holds true across you know, these constructs. I did see, which isn't available in this uh, submodel, divergence in levels of knowledge and awareness. So there are some um, you know, emerging findings from doing a multi-group analysis approach, as you see in the title today. Um, but on the other hand, this survey, or the online, um, let's say, how did I put that right? The online survey results at the quantitative level, the survey items, they don't capture this. So I'm trying to then support this, as you'll see in one or two slides time, with um, qualitative data where we can get richer insights. So we can move on to the next one. Perfect. So this is just a little bonus on safety, so we can uh, tap into it slightly more. And again, it's a lot of consistency, let's say, within um, each group across those five measures we heard about. But then we see the distinction between the very engaged group being quite more, um, say, necessarily pro-safety, but they're more confident in hydrogen's uh, safety level, again, compared to natural gas. Um, that, that's fine for this slide. It's just to show it visually. So we can jump to the next one. Perfect. Right, so th this is um, pretty nice to have. Could have been at the beginning, but I chose to situate it here. It's these qualitative remarks around safety perceptions, and they kind of bridge along with um, social representation of hydrogen. And people are actually sometimes even comparing hydrogen to nuclear power, which is quite um, interesting to you know, factor in. Um, people who are a bit more technically aware are touching on things like embrittlement and um, gas leaks and so on. Again, quite interesting. But by and large, it's mostly generic responses about explosiveness, flammability, and danger. And we can see that on the next slide. Right, so again, we didn't have a huge volume of responses on, on negative safety perceptions. It's only 42. But when we tried to break this down a little bit more, we saw a few people, again, touching on hydrogen being odorless and colorless. Um, 
They mainly talked about it in terms of danger. But I think if we were able to access you know, a larger pool of results, it'd be very interesting to see if this kind of stays quite consistent across the sample, across the population. Or again, if we are maybe engaging with different stakeholders or technically engaged people, would, would they be maybe raising these issues around embrittlement or the characteristics of hydrogen a bit more um, higher? So that's the only actual um, visual output I have on safety, because again, it wasn't a major, major one in my findings um, from the qualitative responses we had at the end of the survey. So we can go on to the next one. Right, so again, the quantitative responses, just to clarify, because I think I'm skipping in, you know, in the lunch break coming up. Um, we had the 1845 uh, sample, and then we had 1200 responses at the end, which were qualitative, you know, statements, we were written statements, people saying whatever they wanted to add, you know, to reflect on the survey. And we had 104 responses on safety, you know, just under 5% of all the responses we gathered. And it's quite, you know, an immediate uh, finding just from this one graph that the very engaged group, again, maybe not so surprising, they're the only ones really touching quite a lot on safety benefits. So, for example, they would have given statements that, oh, this is going to remove the risk of um, carbon monoxide poisoning, or there could be other potential uh, safety benefits that hydrogen might uh, facilitate in the future. And that's actually a statistically significant finding. But the sample is quite small. So again, it's tentative. I wouldn't really um, pin, pin myself down too much to this finding on the sample size, but it might be indicative of, of, of future trends, if you will. Uh, we can go to the next one. And this is also with one. So yeah, now this is actually work that comes out purely from the qualitative results. Again, we have those 1,200 or so responses. And I developed this ahead of running any of that modeling you saw on the full sample. So it's kind of shown here at the end, but it was already established ahead of running the model. And it really shows this kind of spectrum, or we call it sometimes in our work, this matrix. And we saw it earlier on how consumer responses you know, can fall from negative to positive and lots in between. And at the same time, they can be quite multidimensional. So we had a category here of hopeful yet cautious which was almost equivalent to some of the one-dimensional categories. It was about 7%, and we had, let's say, I think it's here, skeptical was 8%, and neutral were 8%, so very similar. And we had other multi-dimensional categories that made up for the remainder, but they weren't on this kind of uh, proportion. So that's the main one to catch. And I think it's quite interesting, because if we think about hydrogen, as we've understood it you know, up until this current point in time, and then even you know, forecasting a bit into the future, P people are quite hopeful of this prospect. You know, the hydrogen economy has been talked about for a plenty long time, and find now it's much more in the media, and maybe the awareness and knowledge will gradually uh, grow over time. But at the same time, they have this kind of apprehension or caution, whether it's because of past uh, experiences of hydrogen, those representations from the 20th century, for example, or it's just kind of human nature that uh, hydrogen might be unsafe because it's you know, a flammable gas and so on. So I think that hopeful yet cautious category is quite an important one to tap into further in future work and try to unpick this, which we, we do to an extent because we, we develop the hopeful yet cautious category based on their statements, where on the one side they might say something like, we're hopeful about hydrogen helping us to reach net zero or having environmental benefits but we're worried about safety implications or we're worried about cost implications and so on. So we, we do this to an extent, but I think it's such a rich area that it needs a lot of follow-up work. And obviously in, in an ideal uh, case, we'd have cross uh, country studies coming in too. And also looking within different regions of the UK, more specific than what we had in this um, broadly nationally representative survey. So again, we might want to target the clusters, for example, we might want to know much more categorically about hydrogen acceptance in Scotland than we pick up just from this survey. Um, so we can go to the conclusions and hopefully leave a couple of minutes for questions before lunch. So I think really you've probably picked up because I had a few slides that were emphasizing and repeating a bit of this work. It's kind of the case that 
I think, you know, consumer perceptions and perspectives, they have to be accounted for very much in this multi-dimensional way. Um, if, if we don't take that approach, we, we kind of have this risk that we simplify matters. And again, I've only picked up now because of Leslie's update about Whitby, which means I have to update some of my papers where I was saying, you know, this is a cautioning what could happen, but it's actually the case that now the trial is delayed or cancelled even. Um, but I, I think some of these findings could have preempted that, for example, but we weren't obviously in the right timeline to achieve this. And maybe in Fife, it's gone much potentially more smoothly or they, they've done the steps um, correctly, for example. So I think just to kind of sum up, um, definitely linking the community benefits of hydrogen much more clearly while also accounting for these different production pathways. So at the moment it's the green and the blue, but you know in the future we might be also having discussions. Maybe it's not the UK context, but nuclear is going to feature in some countries. And this makes a whole kind of more um, complicated ball game to deal with, if you will, with the consumer perception side. And of course, we've got the CCS part of the blue hydrogen to account for. So there's a lot there to unpack around the production and what it entails. And of course, you know, storage is factoring into this. But I would also agree uh, with the previous presentation. There's not too much knowledge about this, especially, especially in the public. You know, in the survey, I don't think I had very few responses about storing hydrogen in the qualitative outputs. Um, by and large, people are actually asking for a lot more information about hydrogen so that they can form these opinions and, you know, stick, be more kind of uh, confident or reliable in forming a perspective. Um, that's why we had this neutral category being about 8%, but at the same time we had hydrogen cautious. And um, I think I called it, let's say, if I'm getting it right. Um, Hi, Joe. Yeah, Hazel Dean here in the room. Uh, we're over time with your presentation. Oh, right. oh that's Can fine. Yeah, so this was the just two sentences or something to finish off would be great. Yeah, it's perfect. So you can go to the next slide, which I just put there um, because it's available. But basically, you know, bring, bridging this all together and to wrap up, there's some aspects here which can't be captured directly in the model you saw today, but they come through this other data set. And the three main takeaways I want to mention, you know, in addition to what we talked about, the production side, the community benefits, we had the knowledge deficit around hydrogen. We had the um, environmental benefits, so that was you know, reflected in the model, but we also had the financial risks. And these three were explaining the consumer differences, if you will, the heterogeneity in our results. So these were the three main aspects that are flagging up. And that has to be obviously bridged with this modeling work and other studies to get a more comprehensive outlook. So that, that's perfect for um, the time today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, we're over time, so I don't really, is there anybody who's got a desperately urgent question to ask Joel? Or are you happy enough at the moment? If not, then we'll just pass. Thank you, Joel, for your Thanks extensive so and detailed presentation to the room. Everybody here is now heading off next door for lunch. So thank you very thank much you. indeed. And I think it's interesting in the whole session to contrast those different ways of engaging with the public. And clearly to me, the actual on-site engagement with H100 has been spectacularly successful and shows the value, I think, of actually knocking on doors and doing the one-to-one -one because from the pictures showed of the uh, of the Fifey Wifeys, uh, I didn't get the impression they were raving Twitter users either. So uh, again, it's horses for courses. Quite interesting for me in this. Thank you.